Well, good morning and welcome to the eighth meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. May I ask everyone to turn off any electrical devices that may interfere with proceedings? And uh, we have apologies today from Jackie Bailey and Gordon MacDonald. Now, item one on the agenda is uh, a decision for the committee to take items six and seven in private. Are committee members agreed with that? Yes. Thank you. And we now turn to our inquiry into con construction and Scotland's economy. Now, this is a roundtable session. I'd welcome all of the uh, apprentices we have with us and the others with us. And I thought maybe to start it would be easiest if we simply go uh, quickly round the table and if everyone introduce, uh, introduce themselves, give their name, um, the, the college they're at, of course, they're taking, and also the committee members for the benefit of, of the uh, apprentices who are with us today. So I'll start with uh, Daniel McKelvey. Hi, I'm Daniel McKelvey. I'm a trainee cost manager at Turner and Townsend, and I go to Heriot Watt in the construction and built environment. Uh, my name's David Watson. I'm currently an adult apprentice in joinery at New College, New College Lanarkshire uh, in the Mullow Camps. Uh, my name's John Mason. I'm the MSP for Glasgow Shettleston, which is the east end of Glasgow. I'm Jessica Morris. I'm an apprentice building standards surveyor for Edinburgh City Council, and I'm studying construction in the built environment at Harry Watt University. I'm Asher Humphrey Martin. I study architectural technology at Edinburgh College. I'm Jamie Hacker Johnson. I'm a Highlands and Islands MSP. Hi, I'm Elliot Ruthven, studying uh, plastering at Edinburgh College. Hi, uh, oh. Hi I'm Liam Cork. I'm, uh, I can't speak. <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I should have said you don't need to press any buttons, and that's yeah. that um, helps people with the. Uh, um, Co-bridge doing joinery at Motherwell College. I'm Angela Constance. I'm the MSP for Almond Valley, which is the Livingston side of West Lothian. Uh, I'm Ryan Patterson. I'm studying plaster at Edinburgh College. Uh, I'm Charlie Colm, and I'm a painter and decorator at Edinburgh College. Colin Beatty, uh, MSP for Midlothian North and Musselburgh. I'm uh, Jonathan Scott, uh, I'm a joiner at Mullow College. Andy Whiteman, MSP for Lothian. And we have the, the clerking and um, official report team as well here. So um, welcome to everyone. Um, I'd just like to start with a, a question to uh, the apprentices, whichever of you would like to come in. And if you simply indicate by raising your hand, and then the sound desk will operate the mic system, which, as I say, I should have said right at the outset. Um, what, what attracted you to uh, construction-related apprenticeship? Uh, we'll let David Watson go first. Uh, the the ob obviously, the opportunity of the money you can make in the type of industry. Um, and coming from a personal experience, my, my father's a joiner and my brother's a joiner. It's kind of like a natural line of progression <laughs> to get into a sort of trade, you know what I mean? But I, I definitely think it's a, a job opportunity where you can uh, earn a good living for yourself. Yeah, there's definitely a lot more opportunities within that industry. Um, leading to other things, whether you go into management or the education side of things, but I think that's my main interest personally from a personal point of view. So, mm. um, Jessica Morris, I wonder, would you like to comment? Um, I think it's also the wide array of projects that you can get to see. I mean, in Edinburgh especially, there's there's always so much going on, and, and you never really see the same thing twice. So I think it's I think it's definitely interesting because it's just how much is going on. Good. And, and do you have friends as well who are in apprenticeships, or is it more a sort of family thing that might have encouraged some of you into it? Are there other reasons that uh, some of those here have decided to go take the route they have? Um, yes. Friends, but they're in uh, different trades. Like my friends are like an electrician, a mm -hmm. engineer, but obviously I'm a joiner. But just in terms of when we were at school and stuff like that. It was like an attractive thing to get in there. It was an apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about others? Um, Ryan? Uh, my granddad and my, my dad, they did like <coughs> trades and stuff, and I was just kind of surrounded with it for my life. So mm -hmm. just uh, kind of caught on. And is it, is it something you'd recommend to friends or family members? I have, I have done, yeah. I have done. One of my friends, he's taken an electrician 
course. So uh, yeah, I have done. Yeah, and uh, Elliot. Yeah, I've got friends coming back from travelling that are wondering what what to do. So I recommended something in construction, something hands-on. You can see yourself with the job satisfaction. You can see yourself build something with your own hands or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Good. And I think Andy Whiteman wanted to, to come in. Yeah, I'm just interested in um, how you found out about apprenticeships um, and what, you know, what kind of support was available in school to give you advice about where to go and how to pursue your interests. I don't get any comments about how much support they were offered or whether it could be improved. Uh, personally, I found out about the, my apprenticeship through Apprenticeship Scotland. Um, I'd say that the school support was varied. It, it was kind of more pushed along the university route instead of the apprenticeship route. Um, there was support there if you went and asked for it, but if you didn't really know what you wanted to do, then it was it was very hard to find it. Um, but afterwards, yeah, just kind of Apprenticeship Scotland was, was quite a good tool to find out about them. And I think Jessica and then Elliot. Um, I left school six years ago, so I don't know how much has changed since then. Um, but careers advice was very, very poor at my school. Um, I received my first and only careers meeting uh, three weeks before I went on to exam leave in six years. Um, and if you weren't interested in university, it was almost as though you were ignored. Um, there just wasn't the information available for any other route. So I think mm -hmm. that's something that needs addressed. And Ellie? Sorry. Pardon? How did you end up where you are then? Um, through my own research and my job Scotland. That's okay. where I ended up. Yep. And, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I left school five, six years ago as well. Everything was sort of pushed down the university line. And if you weren't going to the university, you were sort of left to find out what you want to do. Because the career's advice was, if you're not going to uni, well, if you were going to uni, sorry, you were given, right, these are the grades you need, and that was sort of it. Whereas if you wanted to go on an apprenticeship route, you were just sort of left to find out what you wanted to do. Yeah. Jamie Palco-Johnson, committee member, wanted to come in. Yeah, I just, I'm really interested in this point, and just very quickly, I'm just wondering if, if the other apprentices can tell us, is that lack of careers advice, lack of a kind of engagement with careers uh, advice liaisons, is that fairly common, that you maybe have very sporadic, very occasional uh, advice rather than kind of proper, consistent advice through your, through your kind of early time at school? Yeah, we just kind of got put on a website and we had to explore ourselves. There was someone that came in and talk to us about it yeah. and uh, we just had to learn from there really that was it um, when I was in I was in school I only have about a year's experience of school in Scotland but um, when I when I moved here it was very it was, it was quite limited they asked what I wanted to do and what I didn't know and I said I'd consider taking a year out um, then I was just kind of left and there was no further advice. It was just kind of, you'll figure it out when you when you do decide to go into education. So, so that's kind of where I was. Yeah, and Charlie Coom. Um, my school wasn't actually that bad with careers. Like, they'd always give you like meetings and they take you out classes and like push on to what you wanted to do. Like you you know you tell them what you wanted to do and they'd like try find a route for you. But for me, they end, like I wanted to leave school, so they put me on this uh, working right, which is like a charity thing, and that's how I got into my apprenticeship. But that was me basically doing it myself, but like also with their help because they were the one that told me about it. So I don't think all mm. schools are like bad with that. <laughs> Um, David Watson, I think. Um, and personally, going on what Jessica, I don't know his name, um, I'm out of school like six years as well. Mm. Um, and I'm an adult apprentice, so I actually started my apprenticeship quite late. And that was from the fact I wasn't really guided in school with mm. the career advice of what route to take. Um, and I'd done my full six years at school and left when I was 18, but I didn't really know what route to go down. And I eventually managed to get a trade apprentice when I was in my 20s, late 20s. But I think if I was given that advice, because I knew myself personally, I wasn't going to go to university, etc., that sort of route, 
And if I was given like a trade route, like that's an option you could take and make a good living out of it, etc., I probably would have took that route, but nobody was sort of gave me a real indication like that was an option. So I personally got my apprenticeship through phoning dif different companies, etc., and eventually got a start and they said they would take me on. So that's the sort of route I went down. Mm -hmm. So just So do you think things are improving if you're speaking to folk who are in early on in college, maybe just coming out of school in the last couple of years, are things getting any better or in terms of being supported and advised or do you not have much experience of that? Um, Liam Clark. I feel like it's getting a lot better because I left school two years ago, I left in fifth year and the amount of help that they gave is quite a lot, like they had different sessions and stuff you could go away, like, but you had to go away, it wasn't like they just put them on, they weren't specific people, but like, they could chose for it, you just had to make your own effort. But it was there, but like, there was stuff there to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Now I'm hearing about sort of flair people who are on in school, they're getting to try trades, they're getting to go to, I've seen them at Edinburgh College, they're getting, while they're still in school, they're getting to practice what it would be like to, if they were at college, doing some certain work that you would do there, whether it's for me, like running corners or whatever it would be, they're getting to try that. Whereas back when I was at school, I never got the option to go to a college to try a hands-on trade or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. And Asher? Um, I'm not so sure about like going to college to try that sort of thing out, but I know that um, since I've been working with the company that I'm with, um, we've had several students from the school that I went to high school um, come for work experience and, and get kind of a view of, of what what the industry is about. So I think that they've definitely improved in kind of facilitating that sort of thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. cool. Good. Mm. Um, John Mason. Hey, thank you, convener. Um, okay, so I, I was wanting to ask about, you know, how your present experience is and maybe especially the mix between how much course studying you get and how much the work is and do the two relate to each other? Do you think it's working, or should, would you rather more time in college, or more time in actually working, or anything around that area? Liam Clark. I feel like there's hundreds of different types of joinery. Like, hundreds of people do, do different stuff. And especially in college, it's like, you learn everything, but they're trying to push... No, I don't know what to say. I, it's like, people do certain types, but they're trying to teach everything. But if you get taught in the one type that you're doing, I feel like you get a bit more experience with the stuff in college and make more sense in work. So tell us a bit about your work, work and then what you're actually doing in your uh, work. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm just like sheeting and roughing, it's called, uh, the first fix. And like with the, in college, we learn about like, how to build stairs and stuff. I don't mm -hmm. really feel, I don't know if I don't think I need to learn that if I'm doing like, one like, first fix. If you know yeah, what I mean. so, it's, so it's quite wide. What they're uh -huh. doing in the college uh, is pretty wide then, yeah. You learn everything. Uh -huh. Is, is that everybody else's experience? That, yeah? Um, I'm a Loading Standard Surveyor, um, and the university course I'm on is quite vague. Um, originally, when we started out, we didn't actually see the relevance of a lot of the modules because they're quite vague, but um, from speaking to my manager in the workplace, he's actually he's all for it because having a well-rounded knowledge of the industry as a whole, it actually brings a lot more benefits because you have a bit more understanding of why we're doing certain things. So um, it may seem vague and unrelevant at the time, but I think in the long run, um, it makes your sort of career more versatile. Yeah, I, I mean, that was my experience all these many years ago when I was at university. I, we did a, a lot of the stuff I did at university was no <laughs> use for me whatsoever. Uh, but anyway, that's another story. Um, <laughs> I think David Watson wanted to know. Well, um, I was just going to go back on what Liam was saying about the joinery and to tell him that he does like a specific thing in joinery and he learns about different things that might, he might not do on site, etc., which I agree with. But in, in our sort of personal course, we are, we are asked to provide evidence with a folio and you build it up for a certain course. But there's, there's certain aspects of joinery because of the type of company you're with that the guys can't get evidence of which becomes an issue for us, because if you can't give evidence of that stuff you're doing, how are you supposed to complete the folio, if you understand what I mean? So because it's that variety, I don't know whether the route to go down for joinery would be do specific 
like specific courses to what you're doing, or because it's that vast, it's, it's, it's very difficult to make it a generic subject. If you get what I mean. So, do you feel the work experience you're getting is maybe too specialised? It's, it's not kind of wide enough, or is that just do you think inevitable? It's, it's hard to say because different companies do different different things. So, I cut, like for instance, I do new build houses, so I build I, I get quite a variety of stuff. But like for instance. Jonathan that goes to our college, he does office fit out. I never do an office fit out. So if I'm asked to get evidence to do an office fit out, so I, it's impossible for me because it's not a, a, the type of sector I'm in, if you understand what I mean. Sure, sure. So it's just a sort of a kind of ongoing issue that we've. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, yeah. That's the same like vice versa for me because, like, whereas David can stand there and do a roof and stuff like that, I'm not going to be doing a roof because I'm in an office, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's just difficult for me to get the evidence, as David says for like this folio type thing in terms of the roofs is one of the specifics. I'm not going to get it because I'm not going to do a roof fitting out offices mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, do, do you think, I mean, could they do anything to change that or is that just the way life is, do you think? I'm, I, I'm not sure, but I, I doubt during my time, my apprenticeship, I'll be doing a roof at all. Uh -huh. uh, just in terms of what I'm doing. Yeah, but presumably you couldn't do everything anyway, I mean... Aye, no. exactly, Aye. it's too broad. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, come in. It's very, it's very hard for a college to cater for an individual apprenticeship. Like co all companies do different things, don't they? So it's very hard for a college to look at a specific person and say, right, you're going to be doing this for the next two, four years, whatever it is. But I mean, are you positive about it on the whole? I'm, personally, I'm okay because I actually work for a very small firm that covers pretty much everything we do in the course. So I'm quite lucky in that fact. But then there's people in my course that would do maybe two things in the, all that we study. Like as David, like you'd maybe struggle to get some certain photographs and things that he's got to collect. Mm -hmm. In my respect, I'm actually okay because we cover everything that we study. Right. So do you think it's quite an advantage being with a smaller business? For me, in my course personally, yes. Yes. Uh -huh. I mean, is there any way to make that apply across the board? Because I suppose larger companies may specialise in doing one thing, like roofs, for example. So it may be that it's it, is it difficult to get a a fit for everyone where you can cover everything, whether it's a small or large firm, because some small firms equally may just do a certain type of... Well, that's it. They're a business at the end of the day. They're going to take whatever work mm. they get. Mm. So they're not going to st stop taking work and take on other, try and take on other work mm. just so an apprentice can finish an SVQ. Mm -hmm. and and it's, quite, it's hard to cater for an individual person. Mm. And do you think there's another way of look, dealing with that or uh, working that out? I'd personally, I personally David Watson, then Jessica. I think personally, um, it's something that you, you could speak about to the employer and see what they actually cover as a business, as a whole, and then like look at the course, but the course is offering to see if it can be covered. Do you understand what I mean? So, but as yeah, I forgot his name. Sorry, but what he was saying about like a college can't cater for every single individual apprentice. It's just impossible because there's that in every trade. It's like a vast variety. So. I, I, personally, I think the course I'm on is, it, regardless of everything, like struggling. The, the college lecturers have been brilliant with us to help us to try and get the evidence. But I don't know, maybe for the guys like for myself that can't get a specific thing in the joinery, maybe like a week you go and trial with another company that does that specific sort of thing, like a roof, for instance, if Jonathan came to my company for a week, just to get the evidence for a roof, maybe that would be sort of an option to go down that route, do you know what I mean? So. OK, I mean, I'll come back to Jessica in a minute. Can I just ask you, David, I mean, have most of your lecturers had experience or recent experience of actually working, you know, in the sector or whatever? I honestly can't speak for no. how long I've been out the, the well, trade. Okay, or right. but, but they can give you examples they can of give real life. examples, yeah, because obviously they're tradesmen at the end of the day, do you know what I mean? So they have been in real life situations yeah, and yes. they can give us sort of experience, definitely, 100%. But whether it, it helps us in the, our situation is a bit sort of different, do you know what I mean? Okay, okay, fair so, enough. Right, Jessica, you want to come in? Um, I think the issue of sort of meeting a vague course um, is an issue for most of these apprenticeships. Um, when I speak of our university class, I don't think a single one of us can meet every single module. Um, and I think it does come down to your employer. Personally, I have a very good employer and they've allowed us to go out to university to do the work-based Instead of doing the work-based learning, we, there's an exception and we learn it in university, but also they've arranged for sort of outsourcing so the stuff that they can't cover in our work. They've looked at other employers and seen, like arranged a sort of work experience again. 
to get that experience to fill in those gaps. Um, so I think it really does come down to the employer and how, mm -hmm. how and much support. Is that the council you said you, yeah. you're with the council, right? I mean, can I ask, is that anyone else's experience that your employer... I mean, that sounds very supportive that they're actually willing to put you out somewhere else to get work experience. Is there anyone else of that, or is that a bit unique, maybe? Sorry, um, Daniel. Um, well, I work with the Turner and Townshead, and I think they've been very supportive towards the university course. Um, I'm in the same course as Jess. Um, they cover quite a, a variety of things, and if, if we can't meet a certain certain like course module, um, then they'll invest the day to put us into university. So we'll take an extra day out of our working day to, to put us there for between kind of six and ten weeks or whatever it is, um, and make sure we kind of get that the module covered. Um, but like Jess, it's, uh, my mark's been pretty pretty good with the kind of whole the whole picture. David again. Um, Personally, from my point of view, obviously, is it Daniel and Jess, they're doing a university course. It's a bit different for us because we're on like a, an apprenticeship course. So personally, my, my company's not given me sort of any support whether they're going to send me somewhere to get the evidence we need for our specific course. Do you know what I mean? And I don't know if that's because we are a, we are a low level course. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know if that's a, a sort of... <laughs> Well, it sounds, it sounds to me like whatever the level is, there's a similar problem. It's like there. double standards, and, and, and I feel, getting, I feel the, you know what I mean? So. Getting the experience, yes. <laughs> uh, um, uh, Ryan Patterson. Uh, I'm with a very small company, so we cover quite a lot of different things. Uh, so I've not really had that issue of not getting what I need for my portfolio. Mind us, you're in plastering, is that right? Plastering, yeah. Right. So. Can you just tell us a little about that and how that works? I don't know much about plastering. <laughs> just... Like, it's just basically the interior of a house, like, just making the walls flat, trying to just make it square, really, just trying to make it flat. So I take it? And yeah, there's... I mean, so you get different you kind get, of plaster in a house than yeah, a, yeah. an you, office, you get, do you? You get outside work, which is, like, dashing, just kind of, like, dashing, do you know what I mean? Like, little stones on the house, and you get wet dashing, and they, they like, protect the house from weather, and just to make... The look, like, look at the house nice. And you got all that kind of experience then yeah, with your yeah, firm, yeah. Definitely. So I've not got much of an issue of not getting what I need right. for this portfolio. But you know other people who have, a, because they're only doing the Yeah, there's thing. some people in my college course that are only doing outside work mm -hmm. and they don't do much inside work, so they kind of struggle to find what they need for doing inside stuff. And so they have, they have that issue of trying to mat, like, somehow get that kind of information for the portfolio, which they do struggle on getting. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. I think Dean Lockhart wanted to come in with a supplementary. It was just to follow up on this question of sharing information and getting evidence. Are any of you members of trade associations or trade organisations, do they help in any way, or is it more your employers are the members of the trade associations and you don't really get involved? Um, Liam Clark, I think, wanted to come in. No, OK. Uh, David Watson, um, then. Personally, for the question you asked, I've, I've, I've not been informed about a trade organisation or a trade association. I've never heard it. This is the first I've heard it. No one's ever told me what it does or what it... I don't know if it would be a help for us, personally, for the course. So it's not, never been something that I've ever... I don't know, speaking about... Because Jonathan and Liam are both in my course, but we've never been told anything like that in our course just now. So, no, so has any, so. any of you been told about that or know about that sort of thing in what you're doing, um, Jessica Morris. Um, we have several unions within our workplace um, and we're made aware of them within the first month of working there. So um, I'm a mm -hmm. student member. Um, I've not had much involvement with them yet, but uh, I think if I ever did need them, it would be a sort of um, unbiased sort of party to sort of go to. Yeah. Yeah. Right, uh, let's see, Colin Beattie. Hey, um, I'd like maybe to ask something which will probably be a bit controversial. Do you think you get paid enough? No. <laughs> <laughs> Funnily enough, I thought that might be the answer. But genuinely, I mean, uh, are, we, are wage levels at, the, at this point adequate? Is it a reasonable remuneration for where you are at this time? Personally, because we're still learning as an apprentice, I think it's all right because you've got that ambition at the end of your apprenticeship. You're going to earn a lot more 
since when you started. So, personally, right now, obviously, whilst you're learning, yes, definitely. Jessica Morris. Um... Yeah, I, um, I consider myself very fortunate to be able to study full time whilst <coughs> being in a full time job that's relevant. Um, and I think the pay reflects that. I mean, I pay a mortgage, I pay my travel expenses quite comfortably, and I still have money left over. So it may not seem much to some people, but I think given the circumstances, it's, it's a fair wage. I think Elliot and then Daniel. Probably, like, I do agree <coughs> you are special. As we were away from work for two weeks and learning and still getting paid for that. But as an adult apprentice, I'm probably the opposite. My wage, I've got to pay rent, council tax, bills, whatever it is, car, all of those bills, and then still pay for your normal amenities is quite... It does stretch your low, like if you're not getting a little bonus or whatever it is at the end of the week or two weeks, it is a stretch to cover all those bills when you're on basically minimum wage. I personally think that the kind of the wage we're getting for a first year apprenticeship is is very good. Um, you know, you get the chance to go to university as well. You know, study kind of full time. You know, work towards your degree whilst getting the the work experience. So I think yeah, overall it's kind of a it's, it's really good. In terms of, I think it's fair. We're we're on less money than like uh, a full on tradesman, but they do more of a job than us as apprentices. So. I think it's fair enough. It is tight, but it's fair enough. Do you find that uh, you've got any work-related expenses that you need to meet yourself out of your uh, out of your wages? Well, personally, I personally I work in um, Haymarket, so uh, I get the train for Liv Livingston. Um, obviously, Scott Rail aren't the, the best for prices, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> um, Pay that, and then obviously my car as well, and um, rent. But mo mostly the kind of the, the trains are the 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 hard hitter. Mm. Does anyone else have that sort of experience? Uh, well, I'm probably opposite. Like, if we have anything that's to do with work, and then your apprenticeship, the employer sort of covers it, or CITB, your local the organisation, they put you through as well. They sort of. But what sort of expenses up. would they be? Um, whether it's well, I stay. I live in the borders, but my apprenticeship's up here, so they put digs cover, like places to stay when you're up here, so that's covered. Uh, if you don't have a car and you need to find travel up to your digs, that's covered by CITB and your employer. So most of the things you'd have to go out your way to pay are covered by these people Is to help you when you're on such a low. Well, when you're on not as much as everyone else. Is that the experience of everybody? <clears throat> Going on the terms of travel, I'm from Copebridge and I'm working in Edinburgh at the moment and obviously what uh, Daniel was saying about ScotRail, that is a biggie for me as well because of the travel to and from work. But going on what the CIDB um, thing is experience, I don't think CIDB have been that supportive for me personally. Um, I do get travel expenses from my work but it was myself that had to fight for the travel expenses whereas I thought as an apprentice I should be getting more support from the CIDB constructing body. Um, but it was me on my own back that fought and fought and fought, and it took weeks before I actually got the right amount of expenses for me to come in through to and from work. So I'm not, I'm not obviously complaining about it just now, but at the time it was like I felt as if it was pressure because I was worried about how am I going to get to work and things like that was going through my head. But obviously now it's all sorted. But I felt as if I could get a bit more support leading up to that. If you understand what I mean. So, so you're saying that really for what you got, you had to fight for. Apprentice, yeah, and I th which I thought was a bit unfair, obviously, under the circumstances. Because going back to the sort of minimum wage as an adult, we don't, as, a, as an adult, you have got a bit more to pay for, etc. And um, worrying about a train ticket is the last thing in your mind, do you know what I mean, to get to work. Because if you can't get to work, obviously, you can't get paid full stop. So there's all those worries. And I did raise this with some, some of my CITB officers, seeing what they could do for me. And I just never get any feedback. They say they would see, they would speak to their higher sort of people higher than them, and they never get back to me. It wasn't until I actually fought myself to get the, the right expense for me to go into from work. So I just don't feel as if I want to go through that each time I'm going from job to job, if you understand what I mean. Because nobody wants to, if you really, do you know what I mean? It's that pressure that you don't need. So 
that's just my personal experience. So. Can I ask you? you come in? Sorry, Colin, I was just thinking Elliot wanted to come and just. Piece of devil's advocate on that fact. I had a quite a supportive apprenticeship officer who actually laid out saying this is what we can all cover for you, or the employer should cover for you. So we were, when we first started apprenticeship, we noticed that these are things we don't have to pay for. So say you had you couldn't pay you had to travel up and you needed someone to pay for it. You'd say that to your apprenticeship officer and you'd fill out a form and then that was it. So it was just to be devil's advocate on that fact that it can sometimes just be how supportive your apprenticeship officer is. If they're always saying, oh, we'll see, we'll see, whereas I had one that was just like, right, here's what you do. And is it partly about getting the information in advance when you start? So yeah, I think you know that is how to definitely, if you can get all that in advance to know what you should be getting as an apprentice. Okay. Can I ask, the employment can sometimes be a wee bit of a bumpy road. If you had problems in your apprenticeship, who would you talk to? Who would you speak to about it? Personally, I would speak to my site manager. It's my site manager that I've spoke to through everything. and I've been quite lucky that he has been very helpful and because it's not his decision at the end of the day about the expense and things that I said earlier. He needs to go through his sort of hierarchy to obviously try and fund me to get to work, etc. But my site manager has been very helpful, so it would be my site manager being my first sort of contact that I would deal with personally. I mean, I'm, I guess I'm talking about things like difficulties with your training, which to some extent you've covered, and things like bullying, which do happen in the workplace. Are you confident you've got someone to go to that would help you resolve that? Um, so there was like an incident at my work where this person was like getting a bit too weird and I don't know if it's because I'm female obviously in a male trade um, but basically I told one of my workmates and my workmate told the office so the office then like had a word with me and was like you know just like making sure I was okay um, so I'd go to like my boss or the office or any of my tradesmen like because they're really like nice and they help anyway so if something's wrong I can always like go to them. Well having experienced uh, an issue in the workplace are you happy that it was properly dealt with? And yeah yeah resolved? definitely definitely. Is it Gash or you wanted to come in on some of these points? Yeah I was just gonna kind of say following on from what what Elliot was saying about um, the apprenticeship officers from CITB, I mean, I have a very supportive workplace as well, but um, we, we kind of have a, a regular meeting or check in with our, our apprenticeship officer and they'll ask us, are you being paid fairly? Are you being treated fairly? Are there any issues? And so I, I think it's quite good that they're, they're happy to address that for us as well. Uh, Jessica Morris. Um, in my workplace, we have um, workplace mentors, and I think with the university programme, um, everyone who's on the course does have a workplace mentor assigned to them. Um, so any issues I would bring to them, and they sort of sort out any issues between the work and the university, um, they sort of act on my behalf. So the mentors are good. And point actually, does anyone else have a, a mentor, someone who's allocated to them to? Yeah. yeah, just the exact same as Jess. We have a university mentor and a workplace mentor, um, so the, they communicate quite a lot as well, as well between the kind of three of us. So if we have got any problems with whether it's university or the workplace, then we can go to either of them, um, as well as our kind of my line manager especially is pretty invested in, in the university programme as well, so he's always kind of checking and making sure everything's going okay with it and, and things like that. Has mm. anyone else got a mentor? No? Uh, from the apprenticeship route, it's really your tradesman that's kind of your mentor, the one that's teaching you, or your line manager. We've not really got anyone, well, apart from a CITB officer, but there's not really anyone like you can really sort of go to. And going on the fact what um, Asha said, in terms of your CITB officer coming out to site, they do do that with us, um, but there's points that you do raise with them that still just, personally from my experience, that still don't get dealt with. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of left twiddling your thumbs thinking, well, what do I do now, do you know what I mean? So there is only so many sort of avenues you can go down with the options you've got, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, Elliot, you wanted to yeah, It's just not been mentioned it, because we've 
got quite a small course compared to everyone else. Our lecturer, we're actually, because we're a smaller course, we can get some more specific time with the lecturer. Like, they've been, they might have been through experiences, either been in the trade, whether it's bullying in college, whatever it is. I think you've got quite a close relationship with them as well. You're with them half the month as well as your tradesmen. So I find that, and they can sort of advise, even if you tell them first, they can even advise who you should tell if it's in the workplace. Um, like you could tell your CITB officer or whoever it is. Because you're with them is just as much as you're with your people at work. Do, do you think it depends partly on on the people involved? Because obviously, you know, people have different pressures on them at different times. Not just you as apprentices, but also the people you're working with. Um, and people don't always get things right. I mean, none of us, none of us do. Um, but from the point of view of having a system in place or knowing that you've got someone that you can go to if things are working as they ought to. Is that, do you feel that you've got that there? Yeah, well, like, if you say this problem was in the workplace, but they're under high demand, that's the problem, why they're causing the problem, and you go to the, your boss with that problem. But they're already stressed out or in some sort of situation because of the work under pressure that they're under to get the job finished or whatever it is. They've already got problems. They don't exactly want your problem as well mm. as that. But I suppose people have to make time to deal with what needs to be yeah, dealt with. Do you feel that the, there is the time made available to deal with things that need to be dealt with, from your experience? From my experience, because I'm with a small firm, yes. Mm, but, okay. And we know our jobs day to day, week to week, whereas if I think if you're sometimes with a big firm, they're under high demand to get this job finished within a certain time period, that they're just, right, well, OK, we'll deal with that problem, and then the apprentice is just left to get on with our work. Do, do others feel that way or think that's a fair assessment of things? Um, David? Uh, personally, going from from that, because um, I do work with quite a large firm, mm -hmm. I would completely agree because they are under a tight schedule mm -hmm. and we are just left sometimes to like do with our own devices. Mm -hmm. but I, I would completely agree with that comment, yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. Any others? Um, in that case, um, Angela Constance. Thank you, convener. I wondered if our guests this morning had any views about whether they think young people have a positive or a negative impression of the construction industry, and what more could be done to encourage more young people into construction and I'm particularly interested in how we could encourage more young women to pursue uh, a construction-related career. Jessica. Um, thinking back to high school, um, I wouldn't say it was negative or positive, but when you got to fourth year, there was the sort of obvious people that would sort of, they didn't want to continue in school, and it was, it was the sort of, naughty kids that tended to go on construction sort of type apprenticeships and it was often perceived that apprenticeships were the sort of easy route out um, which isn't right at all and up until about two years ago my sort of impression of the construction industry I didn't have a knowledge of it at all I didn't know what sort of job opportunities there were so when I thought of the construction industry, I thought of, you know, men out on the work site, you know, covered in mud, sort of, there wasn't a good enough image of how many different roles there are involved in the industry. And there, I'm still learning of more now. So I think it has to be communicated early on, you know, there's so much more going on in the industry than sort of first meets the eye. And Jessica, do you think um, employers and schools could do more to give a, 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 a better impression of the construction Absolutely, industry? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Have you any ideas about what would help? Um, I just think education about sort of careers as a whole is important. Um, I mean, just all the industries, there's very little knowledge in school about how many different roles there are involved in every industry. Um, so I think it should be sort of, people should be made more aware of, you know, all the different people that influence like the design of a building. So I think, yeah. 
Thank you. Earlier about uh, careers advice and information and about how that was just, you know, a few weeks before you sat some uh, exams. Do you think, um, and I, I don't want to be putting words into your mouth, but do you think uh, that careers information needs to start much earlier in school? 100%, yeah. 100%. 100%. I think, I mean, in fourth year, that's when you start making your decisions on what courses you're going to take. That's, in my opinion, where it should really be in place, like sort of bringing into the school, these are the different options available to you, you know, if you consider this and that and getting the workplace in. I mean, I had one week of work experience when I left school and that was it, so. More work experience earlier on in your school career? Yeah, I think, and that's what I like about the apprenticeship as well. I mean, I've got friends that went to university and dropped out because they didn't actually know why they were learning something. Whereas I'm in the workplace, I'm actually gaining experience and actually working it if I actually enjoy the job. Until I mean, a lot of people go to university and then after a year of actually being in a job, they realise they don't like it. So I think having that work experience in early, they actually get a better idea of what they're getting in for if they actually want to go down that route. So I think work experience early on is okay. beneficial. Thank you. And I wondered if um, our other guests have uh, any opinions on this. Ryan? In the school that I came from, we, uh, there was one week every year where from third year onwards you'd get the chance to go and work, like work experience. Mm -hmm. So everyone, like they'd stay in school or study or they'll get out and like learn something from a job for a week, mm -hmm. like work experience, which uh, is, that's what I did. And uh, I've, like, I went in the summer and worked, did the work experience again and just to get some money over the summer. So uh, the work experience that, like, in the school that I came from was, was really good and it gave people opportunity to learn about different things while still in school and give them a kind of an idea of what they want to do. So if I've understood you correctly, Ryan, um, the, the opportunity for work experience at school actually helped you yeah. find work experience over the school holidays? Yeah, I uh, went to... It wasn't with the same... I met him mm. while I was doing a different like work experience that week, and I uh, asked him... Like, he put a post on Facebook, social media, saying that he's looking for an apprentice, and at this point I was waiting for my exam results, and uh, I was just working with him over the, over the summer holidays, and I decided to just stay on, and uh, I worked a year with him, and got my apprenticeship with them the next again year. OK, thank you. And Charlie, do you have views about how we could make the construction industry more attractive? Um, I think, well, first of all, advertising, right? Because, um, like, you know, there's no, like, photos of, like, female painters or, like, any trade. It's, like, it's always men. So I feel like if, you know, there was more information about females, and it's like, well, for painting, for instance, it's like you could go into like interior as well, like within that. So like you could literally decorate like a whole house, like or something. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really know. Are role models important then, because you spoke about um, the information literature. If 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 that had, you know not just young men, but, you know, uh, young people from, you know, all walks of life and all backgrounds, including young women. But in terms of uh, meeting um, women who are already pursuing careers in the construction sector, would that help? Probably, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it just needs to be, like, put out, especially in, like, school. Um, I mean, I'm the same as Jessica, I only got one week of work experience mm -hmm. and I was doing hairdressing and it was nothing like I thought it was going to be. Mm -hmm. So I feel like maybe they should like put a trade in as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know like in my school they go out to college now so they can experience it before they actually leave school. Um, but I just feel like, you know, it should be like more open about females doing it and mm -hmm. more because it's not all like hard labor mm -hmm. you know there is like some good bits of it so 
So uh, I'm really interested. How how did you make that leap from hairdressing to construction? What what was the spark? Well, I used to dye my hair a lot, so obviously hairdressing was like I don't know. I guess something that kind of I wanted to do when I was younger. Um, but I think it was more the people than the actual work itself that put me off. So, you know, because one bad experience can make you, like, not want to do something. Mm -hmm. Especially at such a young age, because I think I did it in, like, third year. So, I was always, like, into art and stuff, but I didn't want to keep studying. I wanted to, like, make money and do something. And I don't like sitting down in the same mm -hmm. place constantly. Mm -hmm. So, I was, like, painting, because you're mm -hmm. moving about, you're still doing art. It's just a different kind of form. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of how I got there. Mm. Good. OK. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, Daniel. I was just going to say about the, the work experience kind of aspect. Uh, personally, when I was at school, it was down to the individual uh, about where you were going. So if you wanted to experience a trade, you'd have to really know someone who was already in a trade. Um, you had to get like consent forms and stuff signed. So it was a bit hard to kind of just go up to a random trade and go, can I come to your workplace for a week? Um, so it was quite kind of difficult for there, and then um, obviously the kind of high schools would struggle to cater to hundreds of students to get them all workplace placements. But you know, I'd kind of say maybe if we could change that that kind of aspect to it a little bit, it might it might help get the experience that kind of people want for it, um, or even kind of workshops as well. Uh, when we had workshops in school, it was all universities that came and talked to us about their courses and stuff. We didn't really get pitches from different apprenticeship programmes or anything like that. All right. Um, Jamie Halker-Johnson. Thank you very much, convener. Um, Andy Whiteman and I we were at Edinburgh College yesterday. One of the very interesting things that came up was talking about the future uh, of, um, of the construction sector and how, how there will be changes in terms of automation, manufacturing and the like. So I just wanted to ask um, uh, the, the apprentice how you may feel um, changes in the future may impact on your jobs in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, robots, machines doing uh, more and more kind of uh, taking more and more work uh, or roles, how that may impact on not only the jobs and the skills that you've picked up, but how you might have to continue to uh, adapt and reskill and the like. Um, from a personal point of view in plastering, I'm not really worried in that fact. Uh, the product they use, the materials, might all develop and improve, but that is, to see a robot plaster a wall will be the first. <laughs> that will be the first to say, fair enough. But <laughs> it's a very hard thing to get a computer program or whatever it is to do. So, and personally, I'm not really worried in that respect. It's not changed in the past yeah. 30 years, 40 years. So, if it changes in the next, fair enough. You're but ready to take it on. I'm ready to take on to a robot on plaster a wall any day. Yeah. <laughs> Charlie, will that be any different in painting? Do you think? Um, I mean. I don't know, like, at the end of the day, you still need someone to operate the machine. You still need someone to, like, turn it on and off. But it's like, I don't really see it happening anytime soon because mm -hmm. I can't see a robot hanging wallpaper or, like, I don't know, just, like, yeah, maybe, like, cleaning up and stuff. But, like, I don't see it doing anything quite that specific, mm -hmm. so... So no plastering and no wallpapering robots so far. Um, David? Um, just basing on the fact that personally for the joining aspect, that I also can't see a, a, joint, like a, a joiner robot. But maybe in the lifting aspect, we heavier things, etc. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the actual fit out of stuff and the attention to detail, I think personally, as human beings, like with attention to detail, can't see a robot having the same sort of eye as us with certain sort of things. So, I'd say that point. <laughs> Just okay. Yeah, I'd have to agree. Um, there's two elements of my job. We have the sort of work-based side where we assess an application against sort of regulations and stuff. But the other half, we're actually out on site assessing the building itself. And you can't really take the human element out of that. You can't send a robot out to sort of... I can't imagine it anyway, um, but... I think there's a line between getting a programme to do it and actually making sure it's 
Yes, mm -hmm. If I could be devil's advocate just for a minute, I mean, we went out and visited CCG, which is uh, their building in the factories, and their argument is that the robot will always put the nail in exactly the same place in the piece of wood. So there's no human error, there's no nothing, it's all exactly the same, which I would have thought might impact on David's job, and if Jessica knew that that was happening, it might impact on her job. But what but what piece of technology is 100% perfect? It doesn't always go right. That's my okay. issue. Yes. Well, we've even had, uh, I think, discussions in Parliament about uh, voting robots, and I'm not sure whether John Mason thinks we might even have uh, robots as MSPs someday or not. But uh, um, well, uh, I'll hand back to Jamie. Did you want to follow up on some points? So Elliot Sorry, wanted to come in. Yeah, yeah, it was just to go back on that. It's very hard to substitute someone with a trained eye. It's easy for, even if it's, for example, a new builder robot says, fair enough, it went in to do that, but if it was to do a repair, it comes across problems. How is it going to problem solve a certain situation that only someone trained in it for years can do? Like, it's fine if it's nailing, nailing in something that's the same all the way down, but what if you come, a bit, come across a bit, you can't nail it in? There's pipe work or there's whatever it is, you can't... It's very hard for program something to do that when it can come across many different problems in the construction industry. Charlie wanted to come back in and then Ryan. Great, but if you're on an outside job and the robot's working for you, what if it rains? Then it just like malfunctions and just kind of like, it doesn't work. <laughs> Ryan? <laughs> like if, if we Sorry. get like rained on, like we still work, it's fine. Mm. So, I don't know. I was just saying like, we're thinking like new builds and old builds. You've got all these old houses that are all misshaped and and there's things that just like new builds have. So like, new builds, fair enough, robots can maybe do that in the future. But like there's always these old houses that will have to have someone like trained eye to sort out. There's good, good confidence there, certainly, I think, and, and that's certainly encouraging. And I, and I do take the points on this. Obviously, that eye that you develop as somebody with a, with a skill over, you know, over years and the experience, it's very hard to replicate that. Um, although, I mean, the, the, another aspect that did come up yesterday was about the, um, the digital skills, the kind of increasing role of, uh, of digital skills in a lot of apprenticeships. Um, uh, not so much on the kind of robot side or anything like that, but more so um, how new technology can kind of help um, uh, help uh, skilled workers kind of in the future. So, um, I was just wondering if you'd see if, if you felt that that was a, a, an aspect of your um, uh, of your training that you feel is being included enough, or whether it's still very traditional. I suppose what how you're being how you're being taught. Daniel. Um, in my workplace, we've had a few different companies come in and kind of like pitch different ideas to us and what, what we're doing. Um, obviously, I'm involved in the costing aspect, so um, we've had a company that come through with VR technology um, and how they can basically make, make kind of make a, a building that's not there yet and show the show the contractor kind of. That where, where the pipes are going to go and what everything's going to be and how it's going to look, which gives it a better kind of... It can bring your timeline down. It can help you as well for cost because you know exactly what is there. Uh, it just kind of makes everything a lot easier than kind of just looking at drawings and with no imagination. Um, I'd say there's definitely technology out there that's, that's coming in that's going to make it a lot easier. Um, it's just... And you're, trying, you're, you're, you're being exposed to that? And, uh, yeah, yeah, slowly we're getting there. So I'm pro we're probably the, the opposite to that. We're still very traditional. We're still learning skills that our lecturers were taught 20, 20, 30 years ago. There's not many digital things to help improve the way we learn. It's still very traditional, which actually still banks quite good. Like you're still you're learning a traditional way of doing things. It's still very hands-on. I, I personally, I quite like that. Do you, do you use digital equipment at all in your work? In terms just of levels or things like that, or do um, you it's just traditional, still, like spirit levels, water levels. Still, I mean, there is obviously laser levels, that sort of thing, but it's still very traditional in the things that that we use. 
Do you think it would be helpful to have modern laser digital type equipment or? I mean, if it's helpful, yes, but I personally I don't see where it would come in. It's mm -hmm. still very hard plaster wise to bring in something modern when it's been this way for 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah um, Andy. So forgive me, Elliot, I've never done any plastering, but <laughs> it occurs to me that one of your challenges, I think what Ryan was saying, is you want to get things flat mm -hmm. a lot of the time. Could, like, um, laser scanning not help with that? I mean, there is sort of that in it already, but you're still needing the skill you use to get it flat is still the same. Like, the, you might have something laser to check if it is, but the skill you use to get it flat is what they would use 20 years ago. But is, it, is technology helping you in that regard then to develop your skills because you know you, you know better when you're doing a good job or not? Yeah, yeah. In yeah. that respect, it, it probably is. And there's you know things on the internet now, the things you can use to even check to make sure that this is the way you're supposed to be doing it, even if it was done 20, 30 years ago. But in that respect, it probably is. But as I say, the way you're still getting to that end product is by doing it the way they did years ago. I mean, other trades might are probably different. Technology is probably different for them, but in, I would say in our trade, it's still the same. But that was another, sorry, that was another reason I chose the apprenticeship and what I did. It was very traditional, still very hands-on. Um, Asher, you wanted to comment. Um, so a lot of what I do in my work is office-based, just design work on computers, and I think even even in, since I started my apprenticeship, I've found that um, we've brought in new programs and there's been kind of new developments that we've been able to use for 3D visualization of, of designs and things like that. Because it's all like, it's all well and good for me to draw something up and it looks like it's fine on paper. And then these guys will know that something will come to sight and it'll be absolutely <laughs> disastrous. So um, that, that really helps a lot, I think, in being able to to kind of see it a bit better rather than just drawing out a floor plan and expecting something to work that to be able to see the building come together and all of its components i mean i suppose that's that's an interesting point because there has to be the connection between the actual work being carried out and whatever you do in a computer program um so I remember someone i studied with who was a descendant or relative of the composer schubert who would write his own symphonies on a, on a computer program. But he said to me, actually, no human being could actually um, play these, these symphonies. So not much use in that. Um, <laughs> but do you feel that the, uh, the connection is close enough in terms of the modern programs that are coming in that it's actually of use on the construction site? Absolutely. Um, I think for, for some of the subcontractors that my company works with, um, a lot of times before they'll go to, to work on a project, they'll come to our office and speak to us and kind of talk through a job. And I think being able to have that conversation with a 3D model and being able to talk through and even walk through the building um, with the guys who are going to be then constructing it really, really helps and makes sure we're all on the same page. And they can even point something out and say, look, I don't think that's, that's gonna work. I think it'd be better if we were to do something like this. And it, it really helps kind of for us to communicate with them. Um, yeah. Jessica. Um, it's relevant to what Asher was saying because we work very closely with architects and, and the technology does help us a lot. We still get one or two hand-drawn applications and the time it takes to assess them is a lot longer. Um, CAD software, BIM software, it's, it's a lot easier to identify, pinpoint areas you want to look at um, and it's a lot easier to spot problems straight away and um, so I think it's definitely helping the industry. Yes. Good. Um, Jamie? Yeah, sorry, I just had one kind of last question. Uh, it was basically where you saw yourselves in 10 years time uh, within, within your careers and also I suppose to widen out a little bit, how many of you whether in 10 years' time or in the future, would see you taking your skills and perhaps setting up on your own, starting your own companies, or whether going, working, self-employed. Um, we had uh, uh, people from the Scottish Youth Parliament in, and I think out of about 12 people that were all, had all chosen to go to university, I think only one or two considered actually starting their own company up. 
whereas in when you've got a skill, there seems to be a, a good proportion of people that do. So I just wondered how that might, how might that, that might factor in your futures, whether being able to, to take your skills and start your own company up or work self-employed may be part of that. Ryan, well, we were there was a few of us talking before um, before this, and we were explaining, we were describing that, and there's a lot of us that don't really know how. We've not really been taught how to like set anything up for like jobs, like well, come, becoming self-employed, and uh, I think that's one of the main issues of people not starting, and they're just too like they don't know how, or they're, so they just stay with their main, like their boss. But I think that's the main issue on uh, why people are wouldn't start their own business because they're not really sure how and how to cope with it. So do you, do you think? Um your training could imp could include uh, you know, some some advice in terms of setting up, or you know, in the yeah, future. Just, um, I mean, that may not your current employer may not have yeah, that their priority, yeah, obviously, but to, uh, to know this information. But, <laughs> um, yeah, like just even like a little bit in like the training at college, or or uh, we didn't we got some like business and stuff in school, but um, it's not when like I didn't take anything from it um, but yeah there's there's definitely some like we need more information about the becoming self-employed but sure. be something of interest to you so. yeah yeah anyone else want to yeah it was just to, to agree with that like I'd probably personally I probably have later on in life maybe they'll probably the opportunity to go self-employed because I work for someone that just works for themselves yeah. so I'd have the opportunity to take that over but as Ryan said, at the minute, I, I wouldn't know where to start. Apart from asking from them their experiences, I wouldn't know where to where to start. What the risks are? Obviously, you know some of the benefits, but what other benefits may be? The obviously you get you might get some price in what that sort of aspect is at your college, but yeah. there's so many other risks, etc., for going self-employed that you probably don't know about. You think you just probably just think about fine, I get to choose my own hours and I get to choose the work I do. But when in fact there's so many other things you've got to take in. The paperwork, the the difficulties of maybe sometimes finding work, how you get get through that, that sort of thing. So do you work sorry, you just work for one other person at the moment? Yeah. So so actually in the future they may want you to take more of a role in running yeah, so, their business anyway. So I might Personally, from that fact, I might get training in that. Mm -hmm. But I'm talking about for yeah. people in other people's case who, what are yeah. they going to do? How are they going to know what it takes to run a business? Because yeah. it's not, obviously, it's not an easy task. Yeah, thank you. Um, David and Daniel. Um, <clears throat> from a personal point of view, um, I, I kind of want to go down the route of uh, full education, in which the colleges uh, provide and support me for. Um, and I want to eventually do like my higher national certificate in construction management and maybe go down the management route and go down that because you get a lot of benefits the higher you work your way up the ladder. So um, I think being self-employed, there's a lot of risks involved in terms of finding the work and you don't get like your holiday pay, your sick pay, so you need to be earning money to cover that, those sort of things. So I think that puts a lot of young people off becoming self-employed. So, but just personally for me, I, I would like to go down, or even the education route, just sort of further, further education to try and sort of lock my way up the ladder from a personal stand, standpoint. Um, I believe that maybe quite a lot of people will be put off going self-employed because there's quite a lot of <coughs> bits in the construction industry that are really already dominated. Um, it'd be very hard for you to kind of start your own company and get good clients and kind of get good jobs going with, there's already so many different companies that are you know, taking all the work for it, so it'd be, it wouldn't be a really kind of good idea to do. I'd say just kind of work your way up, and your your job would be the best in that kind of you know that kind of way. Okay. All right. Um, anyone who hasn't commented on this question would like to come in just before we um, come to a close. Here, we're just about the end of our our time. Well, well, I think Elliot wanted to come back in, so perhaps give you a last comment on that. Basically, a, a combination of both and David and Daniel's points mm -hmm. there, that that's probably my personal view at the minute. The amount of work I have to see someone self-employed do to cover themselves for 
if they want to take a holiday, if they are sick, is unbelievable. I've, the amount of work they have to go just to cover that. Whereas if you stick in the, the role you're in and go through that management route, you just ask, at the minute I sort of see more benefits that way. Because the, the, it seems to be a lot of work for what they have to cover. And for something as accidental as being sick and you're not getting paid for something you can't help, it's... it's all right, well, thank you very much to all of you for coming in and uh, being with us for this roundtable at the committee today. So thank you very much, and I'll close this part of the meeting and suspend for uh, changeover of witnesses. So thank you very much.
morning and welcome back to our uh, economy committee meeting this morning. We now move on to um, item three in the agenda in our Construction Scotland's Economy inquiry. Um, I'd welcome our three witnesses today. We have Douglas Morrison, Associate Director of Innovation and STEM at the City of Glasgow College. Lorna Hamilton, who is a member of the Scotland Board Association of Women in Property. And also Scott Warden, who is the Head of Faculty for Engineering and Built Environment at Edinburgh College. So I'd welcome all three of you today. Um, just to say that the, the buttons, the sound desk will operate the mic, so there's no need to press any buttons. If you want to come in during the discussion, um, just simply indicate by raising your hand if you don't get brought in uh, naturally, so to speak. So I'll turn now to John Mason for the first questions. Uh, thanks very much, convener, uh, and thanks to the panel for coming along. Um, we, we've had various submissions uh, for this study that we're doing in construction, and I'll not say who said it, but somebody said that uh, the construction industry, quote, has remained in the Stone Age, unquote, when it uh, comes to adopting new technologies. And I don't know if you were in when you, we had the apprentices in just, just now. I mean, I was a little bit surprised that they were not more either optimistic or expectant of new technology coming in. So could I have your views on that? I mean, where are we with new technology? Is that being driven by the colleges and universities or are they just reflecting what's going on in the industry? Mr. Warren? Yeah, I th to be honest, I thought perhaps the, the apprentices undersold themselves a little bit, actually. Because I think the skills that they already come into the college sector with, they've already got IT skills, digital skills, which they are using in college, but I think they just see that as the normal, the standard. So I think they kind of undersold themselves a little bit on that side. Uh, there's still a fair bit of work to, to go there, but certainly on perhaps uh, advanced, advanced manufacturing and off-site manufacturing, that's maybe the direction to go for kind of the, the IT skills and the additional skills required. The terrestrial skills will still be there, but there's a lot of work still to be done on whether we're going to introduce kind of robotics or automation into mainstream education. But I think that's more in a controlled environment, like the, the off-site or new builds to a certain extent. Uh, so there's maybe a bit of work to do there. But I think they kind of undersold themselves a little bit on the knowledge they already have. They touched on portfolios as well. They're already having digital skills where they're using their phones or iPads to collect that information and then bring that back into the college. So they're doing quite a bit on it. It's just I think they see it as a norm. I mean, would, can I just press you on, would, it's Edinburgh College, isn't it, you are? I mean, do you see yourselves as kind of leading on the innovation front? I mean, are you pushing that ahead, or is, is that not really a role for the college? I think for certainly the ME programmes at the moment, I would say there's a new programme in place that came into place about a year and a half ago, and there's not a lot of new technologies within the new programme. So if we are going to add it into it, it's actually the college sector that, that need to put the new technologies into it and the new learning into it on top of the current qualification. I tend to see the future of this being incorporated in the work we do with schools, full-time programmes and leading into modern apprenticeships and looking at how we tie in robotics and automation with uh, kind of coding and programming at an early age so it becomes kind of standard practice and by the time they get into the, the college sector they're already aware of it we start building on it when they're in the MA programme and it's transferable skills that if these skills are required in off-site manufacturing or whether robotics come into a certain part of the industry, then they're, they're kind of trained enough to start. Okay, thanks very much. Ms Hamilton. Um, I tend to agree, uh, Scott. I think they undersold themselves, and, um, and I think that's a generation that just takes certain things as a given now. Um, I, I was slightly surprised, though, that they didn't seem to have a better understanding of, of uh, BIM and, and CAD and just bringing these sort of things, or even mentioning that when they're out on a site, they use a tablet to pull up the drawings. But again, maybe it's just because they take that as a given. That's nothing exceptional for them. Um, I, I think... Uh, I think one of the difficulties that we have within the construction industry is um, the large organisations I have and are continuing to um, develop and broaden uh, digital 
digital engineering or you know, BIM, CAD, all these sort of things, and the off-site manufacturing, and require their supply chain to buy into that. Um, and so the supply chain are maybe sometimes one step behind in certain things, but they're getting brought along, which I think is good. The problem with that is that it can preclude some of the much smaller, the self-employed we touched on with the apprentices earlier. Um, it can preclude some of these people from uh, from uh, dealing with certain contractors uh, and certain procurement methods. So I think that's something that we've got to watch for. Mr. Morrison. Um, yeah, again, I agree with uh, with both witnesses and and everything that they've said. I think um, the key the key thing from my perspective is that um, we we are absolutely right as a sector to be focusing on some of these high value, technologically advanced methodologies that have already been mentioned, um, and of course these these in time will be adopted by the supply chain um, because ultimately they will seek to to secure um, long term work from the from the main contractors. I do think that where, um, where colleges play a, a specific role is in supporting early career development. Um, and again, with the, the evidence that we, we heard this morning, um, it's clear that there, there is more that we can do there. Um, but I think we also um, we work very closely with micro businesses and um, small businesses and sole traders. Um, and you know, as, as, as companies who make up a fairly sizable portion of the industry, there are questions to be asked about how we support those types of companies in the very basic level of digital adoption and digital literacies, even down to, to things like um, invoicing, ordering, managing resources and so on. Um, and I think that as, um, as the rate of digital adoption continues uh, to, to increase, then we will see colleges and universities um, playing an increasingly important role in supporting that type of company and digitally transforming their business. So if we've got the colleges here and we've got the small businesses over here, where does the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre fit into that picture? Okay, so um, I mean, I, I guess before, before I respond to that, I should declare that I have a board position um, with the Innovation Centre. Um, so yes, I, I do know about it. Um, I, um, I, I believe that the, the Innovation Centre um, has now been in existence for almost five years. Um, and I believe that it has, has acted as, as a beacon for innovation um, and a beacon for, for possibility um, within the industry. When considering what the Innovation Centre has done within the college sector, I think there are a number of very good examples where they have been able to, to engage the sector, um, the education sector and the, the construction industry themselves in developing and adopting a wide range of technologies that are aimed at addressing key issues within the industry. And those issues may include sector attractiveness, um, they may include productivity, and um, they may extend to the, the adoption and integration of digital technologies. Um, just a couple of examples I would like to, to pick out. Um, when we consider the sector attractiveness um, issues, which we heard earlier, and I'm, I'm sure we'll get to, um, one of the pro image and things for the whole sector later. Yeah. So one one of the, the projects that um, the innovation centre has supported is the development of a computer game aimed at 14 to 16 year old children, um, which raises awareness of careers in construction, um, has a very strong focus on environmental sustainability, um, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, and responsible investment, inclusive growth. Um, so perhaps have the opportunity to, to speak more to that um, later. Uh, but they are also leading on uh, national developments around off-site and advanced manufacture, um, around building information modelling, around college lecturer CPD opportunities, which is vitally important in, in keeping our, our lecturer expertise up to date. Um, and they, uh, they, they're also investing in uh, a project which is specifically close to my heart, which is around um, supporting SME businesses to assess the extent to which they have inclusive workplace practices. So really getting to the bottom of this key issue um, around the lack of diversity in industry, understanding where um, the underlying issues exist, setting baselines um, where the, the industry can start to measure progress in a meaningful way, um, and for me, the, the, the Innovation Centre are connecting the colleges, 
they're connecting the industry and they're having meaningful impact. Thanks very much. I mean, obviously, Mr Morrison's quite involved in the Innovation Centre. I'm not sure how involved the others are. The, the, we have had the, inf the feeling from some witnesses that the Innovation Centre is not as well known across the country and amongst SMEs as maybe it could be or should be. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, to a certain extent. I would say uh, the last five years has been kind of in existence. As a college sector, I would say I've dealt more with the Innovation Centre in the last year, year and a half, than I have kind of the three and a half years prior to that. So uh, the discussions we've had with them, it's really to find out what, what they're doing, how certainly Edinburgh College and the college sector can get involved with them. And most of the work that I've seemed to have come across so far is kind of university sort of level, research level. And there's not really been that space for uh, the further education sector as yet. But I think they're keen to do that sort of work and get more involved. So I've, I've met with members of staff at the centre recently to see how we in the college and the college sector in, in general can work closer with them and kind of get access to the funding that's available to uh, obviously universities as well. But I think it's really important that I think the message is getting out there now to the college sector that we are there to also guide our local companies uh, and small to small or large companies to signpost them to the innovation centre so the support is there with the help of colleges. Uh, so it's, a lot of it is a signposting issue for us, I think. Okay, that's fair, thanks. Did you want to say anything, Mr Hamilton? That? I think that's... Uh, I'm not on the education side. I'm I, from a main contracting background, so a different perspective, perhaps. Um, I, I think it is the signposting um, so that people know large companies, if they want to explore some bit of research or understanding, start to know where to go um, uh, to the likes of the Innovation Centre. Um, and it's to make sure that, that that's seen throughout the supply chain so that they can take advantage of it. <clears throat> if they're in the know, they know. But if they're not in the know, it's very hard to get that message across. Thank you. Right, Colin Beatty. Um, we've heard evidence that the future of construction isn't necessarily on site, and that, that's been touched on to some extent. The big, inv the big improvements, developments are in factory construction and design. What specifically are the colleges and so on doing to prepare current and future apprentices for that challenge? because it's going to be a very different situation in the future. We can see the developments coming. I think, uh, listening to some of the, the apprentices this morning, they didn't really have a feeling that robotics and automation was going to come into the industry to the level that was going to affect them. And I tend to agree with them to a certain extent as well, that a large majority of the work that they undertake will be based around working in existing houses. I think a lot of the, the automation, whether it's off-site or on-site, uh, in a controlled environment, uh, the percentage of work is quite low. And the environment, certainly if you're doing some of the robotics on-site, it's not really an environment that, that works. The off-site side of it, uh, I know through working with Energy Skills Partnership, who have matched up, I think it's three colleges and three off-site manufacturers, uh, to work together. Uh, in the, the sector at the moment. They are working quite closely, but the numbers coming through uh, for these training programmes at the moment are, are quite small, so it's quite a small part of the market. Uh, the way I see uh, us in the college and the sector developing learners of the future is really through that progression through school, school college partnerships, uh, into full-time programmes and modern apprenticeships. But what we need to be incorporating into these programmes are how they interact with uh, robots or collaborative robots. But it's, once again, a lot of it comes down to the coding and programming side of it. And it's how we build in those basic skills into standard core uh, programmes. An understanding as to what these technological changes that are coming are. I mean, we've uh, had site visits across uh, looking at uh, the production of uh, prefabricated units and so on for houses. Where does it go beyond that? What is it we're actually anticipating is coming down the line and how do we prepare apprentices and people entering the trade for that? When we're looking at off-site manufacturing, 
because the numbers are so low at the moment, it's the current uh, MA students that we have, we can upskill them to a certain to a certain level that when they do go into this the environment that is off site, kind of the technologies that they're using, the ones that I've seen earlier are kind of they look like kind of almost iPad sort of based and they are pretty basic programming and coding uh, technologies. So it's it doesn't seem to be a huge leap from a skilled tradesman or an apprentice to go into that environment, in, in my opinion. We were at the, the Construction uh, Innovation Centre last week and uh, one of the presenters there was talking more so around off-site manufacturing might not be the way forward for the industry. He was part of a cluster of large-scaled house builders, but he almost felt it was a bit of a mixture between off-site and almost IKEA-style flat pack. So instead of just a full house coming out of the factory get good to go, it's part of the kind of timber frame erection that we already do in this country very well, but mixing that with a pod that's maybe the kitchen or uh, the bathroom, and you start bringing the flat packs to site. So there's a bit of a mixture between off-site and that sale of development. Are we saying that technological advances that we're anticipating in the industry may be getting overhyped? Perhaps. I haven't really seen it come through as yet. There's, I think this has been on the agenda for about the last four or five years uh, about off-site manufacturing, and it doesn't seem to have taken off to the extent, certainly the cause sector expected, uh, and the partnerships, and actually the, the kind of training that's required for these partnerships. Okay, um, I, mean, I, I think there's a range of things at play here, um, and I think it's fair to say that um, off-site manufacturing, modern methods of construction are not the the only answer um, to you know to, to the need for uh, for low-cost affordable housing, um, and indeed more housing. Um, but there uh, there is a place for it, um, and I think that within Scotland, what we have started to see is the development development of a network. Um, employer-led network, uh, and also um, some of the excellent work that's been delivered through Edinburgh Napier University, um, which is looking at the business case for, for off-site um, construction uh, and modular construction. Um, this is not necessarily a new technology. Um, it's been done right across the world, um, and it's been done very well. Uh, the, the question that we have is how does this technology, how do these methodologies fit within the Scottish context? Um, and that extends absolutely beyond the technology itself. It looks at culture, it looks at procurement, uh, it looks at availability of materials, and the list goes on. Um, I think that it's, it's too early at this stage um, to, to have any um, evidence-based view on the long-term viability of, of this approach. Um, although I would say that all the, all the indicators are that it's the the absolute direction of travel. In relation to your question about how we identify the technologies that are coming on stream or that are likely to come you know, in, the, in the kind of mid to long term future, that's, um, that's a difficult one to answer. But what I can say is that the industry is focused on adopting technologies that, um, that make workplace practices cleaner, safer and more productive. Um, and any technologies, whether they, they exist within the construction industry now, whether they exist in peripheral industries or ad adjacent industries, if there is a clear business case that demonstrates a positive impact on any of those measures, then I'm confident that the, the industry as a whole um, will consider their, their viability. Off-site off construction aside, it seems a bit vague, what you're saying, as if there's no clarity in the areas in which we can anticipate these technological advances? Okay. Are there areas we can? Yeah, so um, in specific areas where we're already seeing technological advances off-site to, to one side, the, the adoption of building information modelling, um, the adoption of uh, 3D visualisation, which again was mentioned by, by some of the, the contributors earlier today. They, they do, but again, their, their use is fairly embryonic and we will continue to mature in our use of these technologies. I think the, the key challenge is, is taking it beyond the, the design stage, beyond the large contractor stage, and really embedding these practices and technologies 
through the through the supply chain and down into the smaller and medium companies. That that's the key challenge. That's a cultural challenge. The adoption of of these technologies. Just a slightly different thing. How do colleges and universities engage with the thousands of small businesses and micro businesses across Scotland? I mean, it's incredibly difficult. Of course, it's easy to deal with big companies. How do you engage with with these people? They are the backbone, after all, of the of the sector. Yeah. So. Certainly for engaging with, uh, with employers, I think it's something the sector does very well. We've, uh, we've obviously got thousands of apprentices in the college, uh, Edinburgh College itself, but within the sector there's the best part of 20,000 involved in uh, construction alone. So I think it's something we do very well at the moment. I think we could, do, we could support them a bit better along the lines of how we get our students or their workforce into the workplace sooner and at a less risk to these organisations. Uh, I think this industry has perhaps missed a bit of a trick along the lines of foundation apprenticeships. Uh, there isn't a foundation apprenticeship really attached to the construction industry bar civil engineering, but not one for the trades. I think it's really important that if we take anything away from today, a foundation apprenticeship in this sort of area would have been ideal and perfect for the construction industry. And I think it's a very good way of supporting micro businesses to reduce the risk on them taking on apprentices because it's a four year commitment that they do worry about and it's a financial commitment that they worry about. So I think engaging with uh, employers in that way as they are coming through school. So once again, it's getting that pipeline through school, through first year, second year, third year, the foundation apprenticeship kicking in round about fifth and sixth year so that colleges can deliver a programme in partnership with the school incorporating a work placement to enhance that working relationship with a vast number of, uh, kind of micro businesses that we perhaps don't engage with at the moment. So I think that would be a really helpful addition if there was something along those lines. I think that's one of the most uh, sort of critical things is, is the transparency of um, the pipeline of work um, will allow people to take on more apprentices uh, or give them more confidence uh, to do so. Uh, whether that is through uh, the larger contractors, through the supply chain or through the, the, uh, the, the smaller and micro uh, organisations, it's very difficult for them to make that commitment. Um, and I think the more that we can give them surety uh, of work uh, and confidence, the more that they'll be able to take on uh, uh, certain people. Thanks very much, um, convener. Um, we've seen a, a drop in the number of, in, of people, uh, students enrolling in construction college courses between 2008, 9 to 2017, 8, 18, from 24,851 to 17,927. Um, is this a cause for concern, or is this um, due to, uh, if you like, just the state of the state of the industry over the last five, ten years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there are two key issues to, to consider here. The first was the um, the recession that we experienced um, around about that time, um, and we we do know that the construction industry is disproportionately impacted um, by by any economic downturns, um, and of course the the confidence, um, particularly that young people and their parents um, will have uh, their, uh, their advisors will have on entering into a career in the industry. Um, that has been subject to, um, to large-scale layoffs in the past. Um, but we also have to consider the, um, what, what has been termed as the, the war on talent, um, which is, is cutting across our, our sectors just now. Um, and I think the, the emergence of an ever-growing, uh, particularly digital sector, um, which offers very attractive career prospects um, and you know, a wide range of flexible working and uh, potentially high uh, high earning potential. I think it's it's becoming increasingly difficult for for the industry to present a, a, a robust and compelling case um, for young people to to come in and and to commit to a career within the industry. And I think that's reflected in the uh, in the in the decrease in enrolments that we've we've seen. Well, I think I can totally agree with with what Douglas said there. I think what we need to consider as well on on this point is that. The, kind of the, the migrant force 
within within Scotland sits at about fourteen thousand. So there's been a large kind of increase in foreign workers within the industry, which may be taking up some of these roles that uh, traditionally uh, our apprentices would have just taken up these roles. Uh, so there's a fair bit about that. But I would say also within this region, so the South East, uh, we're probably going through one of the largest uh, set of numbers that we've had for a number of years. We're sitting at this moment in time with around about a thousand apprentices within the construction area, which is up about 600 places in this time four years ago. So there is a an increase year on year within this region, perhaps not all around Scotland, but certain parts of Scotland where there is a lot of house building going on and construction work going on, you do see these increases. But I think it does kind of tie in as well with uh, the foreign workforce as well over the last 10 years that may be affecting that number. We're, we're very aware that during the recession, the number of people that dropped out of the industry was high uh, and they've not returned to the industry. Um, they're also now of a generation, they're another few years older, um, where their children are coming up through the ranks and they're not therefore recommending because they had a fallout in their career, absolutely, particularly in the trades. Um, uh, we're, we're very conscious of that. We're also aware um, that during any recession, the last one was obviously hurting us a lot, um, but through any recession, um, women drop out of the industry quicker or don't enter it in the first place. Um, again, because there's probably not the role models, there's not the support mechanism, um, and they don't see the future. And there's other things that can give them a, a, a more stable career environment. Um, and I think it takes the construction industry historically a long time to recover that way from, uh, from, um, from any recession. This one has been particularly hurting. We've been through it for quite a wee while, though, and we're still struggling uh, to to, uh, to improve on things. Uh, and I think it is the com uh, the competing aspects of other industries um, and the negative press. I, 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 you very rarely hear a good news story on the public press. Different if you go to the construction press, but <coughs> we are probably the only people that look at the construction press. Um, for for the man in the street, the woman in the street. They're, they're, they don't see good news stories, um, and I think it's important for all of us to get that message out there about how vibrant uh, construction can actually be. You say they don't see good stories. Are you implying that they see bad stories? They see some bad stories, but they largely see very little uh, uh, about construction uh, in, the, in the general press. So it would be good to get some of the, the, the exciting parts, to get folk to understand that it's... it's it's, a, it's about creating communities. It's not uh, just about uh, laying one brick on top of the other, pouring concrete, doing electrical work, that it is actually creating the whole of the work, uh, the, the environment that we live in uh, and work in and operate in and schools, you know, education, everything that we're involved in. Um, so to try and get that message across within the public press about uh, creating communities, I think we'd go a long way. And you mentioned... Um you're from women in construction, obviously, there's very low numbers of women in the construction industry. And yet we heard from the um, apprentices earlier today um, that they are aware that there's many, many opportunities in, in construction. Is there a problem in the way that the industry is, is promoted um, at schools, for example? Again, we heard from apprentices that they felt that there wasn't a lot of promotion of that as an option when they were at school. I, I think that is an issue, and I think that's been an issue all my working life in the 80s. I'll go back to, I was heavily involved with the CITB, going out to schools to promote, there were no barriers for women going into construction. Um, and uh, this is my opinion. <laughs> um, I, I think we, as an industry, thought we had sussed that, we had got that message across, and that fell away in the 90s. We thought we'd tick that box, uh, and schools understood. The reality is then, careers advisors uh, identified architecture, engineering, um, civil engineering, and perhaps mechanical engineering, um, and they knew about bricklayer, uh, a joiner, and an electrician, and they actually just didn't know about the, the options and pathways 
everything I hear now is very similar, which is, is concerning. Um, and the likes of Women in Property, along with a whole lot of other organisations, are going into schools um, right from... I'm involved with primary engineering to a certain extent. That goes in at seven, eight, nine-year-olds um, to try and get the message across, but also to get the message across to, um, to parents. Um, because I think parents, and you heard most of the, the students here, the, the apprentices, uh, it was friends and, and family uh, that got them into, uh, into construction. Um, uh, a lot of what we're doing is talking to parents as well as careers advisors. And it's not just about the different roles, but it's the pathways into... So gone are the days where you went to university uh, full-time to do your surveying or your engineering and uh, you went to college to do your trades. There is such a mixture uh, of routes in and, and we're all working hard at, at getting that message across. Um, but it's, it's a hard battle. I think on that point, it's, and it was kind of interesting what the, the apprentices were saying, that there still seems to be that kind of stigma attached to it. That, and I, I see it a lot still to this day from teachers or uh, advisors that some of these students that go into construction, they're not very academic, but they make a good tradesman. And I don't think I've ever heard an employer within the construction industry ever say that we don't want anyone that's academic. So it's, I think it's how we change uh, that mentality. Uh, and one of the I think the, the lady that, was, that went to university, she touched on, she was making her career choices at S4. We need to be influencing uh, school pupils at kind of S7, S1. Uh, there's a, a project that we do at Edinburgh College, which is the, the STEM Inspiration Programme. And there's about 3,500 school pupils at that level. Uh, boys, girls from all walks of life, from all schools. Uh, and we're trying to encourage them that engineering, construction, science, these areas are all excellent career choices. So we're trying to influence at that age, but it's, it, it doesn't stop there. It really needs to be that progression, that pipeline, that we're influencing at S7, as I said, and S1. But then the next stage to that is actually colleges delivering construction programmes in schools or coming to the college in S2 and then S3. It's something similar. So you're building on the qualifications year on year and the experience that these young people are building throughout a period from about the age of 10 or 11 all the way through, leading up to, as I touched on earlier on, the kind of the, the foundation apprenticeships, where I see that as kind of instrumental, that within that fifth and sixth year period, it's that work placement, it's work with schools and the work with colleges. And hopefully the work we've done prior to that to influence these young people will tackle that kind of gender imbalance and perhaps influence some of the more academic candidates to take the construction route. Um, yeah, again, just like to, to support what um, our other two witnesses have, have said. The, the industry for, for a number of years has, has worked predominantly on a model of informal recruitment. You know, so it was the, you know, the, the child, the nephew, the niece, and um, the family friend and so on. The industry has never had to work too hard to convince young people coming through the school system to, to come into the industry. Um, and I do feel for, for careers advisors, um, because it, it has to be an incredibly challenging role to try and keep abreast of the, you know, the wide range of sector-based developments across multiple sectors and multiple job roles. Um, and with that in mind, I, I do believe that the industry has a, a key role to play a leading role to play um, in demonstrating and convincing why the construction industry represents a career of choice to young people. I'm seeing that happening. I'm seeing it happening with, with CITB, um, you know, with, uh, with programmes that are being run through colleges and universities, with outreach work that's been done by organisations like Women in Property. I am starting to, to see the, um, the coalescence of a structure um, and, and almost a strategic approach to, to the engagement of young people. Um, time will tell whether that approach is successful, um, but it, it, at very least is beginning to emerge. Okay, thanks very much. I, I um, um, Jimmy Halker Johnson, I visited Edinburgh College yesterday as part of this inquiry, uh, but I also visited Edinburgh College last week, in fact, to meet the principal. Um, 
uh, at, uh, and she was saying that there's still an issue. You, you talked, Lorna, about um, many pathways in the industry and also in education. And we heard encouraging news about how the universities and colleges are also working more closely together. But we still heard there was a problem about parity of esteem between the college sector and universities, despite the fact that colleges, I think, um, I recall are delivering about 30% of higher education courses. So I'm just wondering how that relationship could be improved, both between universities, colleges, workplaces and schools, to really maximise the opportunities for young people to identify exactly what they want to do and have a flexible career path where they may change their, their, their mind about precisely what they might want to do. Yeah, I think on that point, um, there's a fair work, bit of work being done at the moment, setting up obviously the graduate apprenticeship programmes with universities and colleges uh, and how that leads on from foundation apprenticeships. So at the moment, I know there's there's a number of programmes around the country where I'll use uh, civil engineering uh, as an example, where uh, they'll come into the college sector and they're still obviously at school and doing their work placement. When they're finished that foundation apprenticeship, the obvious sort of route is either into that employment or into higher education with universities. And I think there's still a bit of an issue around a consistency with universities, whether some, some see the foundation apprenticeship as worth one hire or two hires or three. So there's that inconsistency there. Uh, but there is that crossover as well, where there's almost a comparative sort of process at the moment that our HNCs, certainly HND's numbers, are dropping within the college sector. And it may, be, may have something to do with the uh, uh, universities trying to increase their numbers at that level. So the entry requirements perhaps are dropping for, for universities and attracting students that would have traditionally came into the college sector, which is obviously having an effect on, on the college sector funding. Uh, so it's how we work together in the future so that there isn't that duplication between qualifications. Uh, and there's, there is a number of good examples, I suppose, around the sector. We have uh, associate degrees with uh, both Napier and Harriet Watt University, where we carry out the, the first and second year, so the HNC, HND part of the qualification, then third and fourth year, they go into the university sector to finish it. So I think that kind of partnership, more formalised going forward, would help. And maybe cut out a bit of duplication where some students will drop off at HNC or HND and then go into the first year of a degree programme. So it's kind of that, there's a double cost there to the system. Um, yeah, again, to, to support Scott's comments, we um, we now have an apprenticeship family that you know stretches from the foundation apprenticeship um, school focused uh, work based learning program through the the, the well known modern apprenticeship and into the, the graduate apprenticeship, um, and again the uh, the development of the the FAs and GAs is, is is embryonic. So there's there's still you know still lots of learning going on. There are still changes being made to try and improve. Um, the connection between uh, those apprenticeships, but also the transition between those apprenticeships. Um, I think Scott earlier raised a key point, which is around the lack of foundation apprenticeships within the, the operative levels in the construction industry, so the trade levels. Um, as it stands, we, um, we do have a foundation apprenticeship. Um, it's set at a, an SCQF level six, which is the equivalent of a, of a higher. Um, and I think it's fair to say that that, uh, that, is, that, or that can be positioned as an academic qualification. Um, but many of the, uh, the young people who we target to go into to operative level roles, they will do so because they haven't connected with academic study, um, with scholarly activity. And so what we do need is that, um, that apprenticeship or that connection um, that can be delivered at a school level which does get young people onto a work-based learning programme, which does give them a meaningful connection to, to future employment opportunities um, and bridges that gap between college and sorry, between school and college, um, which for many young people can be a difficult gap to bridge. Um, and so my uh, you know my my ask would be that um, some consideration is afforded to how we, we integrate vocational training. Um, more meaningfully into the foundation apprenticeship. 
As a, an employer, rather than from uh, the education side, um, I think I think we all acknowledge that um, people come into the industry at all different levels, um, and and the, the folk that have gone in to do apprentices have generally, um, you know, in history, not not necessarily had the, the academic wish or the academic skill set at school, and that can change throughout their life. Um, uh, and uh, there always needs to be a pathway, and there always has been a pathway. Sometimes it's been quite uh, laborious and perhaps juggling about uh, different acad uh, academic institutions, but to be able to take somebody that's gone through their apprenticeship and um, decides they want to uh, further their career in a different way, um, to be able to use that qualification to be able to get into the third year of, of certain courses, that kind of thing. Um, I, and most employers will support uh, people through that. Um, we, I think that's even more important now because we have probably more mature entrants. Um, there was a couple of guys, or two or three of them here, who have uh, been out doing something else for a while, gone and done their apprenticeship, but probably bring a maturity that they probably want to move on earlier uh, in their, their education path now, um, uh, onto management of some sort, supervisory. And I think we've got to make sure that the universities and the colleges can reflect that. I think I touched on the, kind of the foundation of apprenticeship model once again. I don't think it's, we need to start from scratch on this one. Because there isn't a foundation of apprenticeship programme in place at the moment, I think there's a simple solution to it. And that is the first year programme of any of the trades could be used as the foundation of apprenticeship. So it's already there in place. So you're shortening that learner journey. So instead of a four year apprenticeship, so they do a year in school, you're reducing the cost to the employer and then it's three years at the other side of that. So I think it's quite a, a straightforward fix, but there just needs to be a desire from, uh, I suppose, the sector to do that. Thanks. Um, Jimmy Halcrow Johnson. Uh, thanks very much, Kavita. It was just a very brief one, actually, uh, to pick up on a point uh, Douglas Morrison made. Um, you, you talked about having sympathy, I think, with, uh, with um, uh, careers advisors uh, in terms of they have to have, they have, to have a very broad knowledge. Would that suggest perhaps um, the model of career advice it, it has its limitations? Could could we actually have a, a model where there was more specific, um, each advisor had a more specific focus, and therefore they might work within across a number of different schools, but have a, a better knowledge of each sector, whether it's construction or or whatever. Would that would that be a model that might might work? It it, it could potentially. I think every model has its deficiencies. Um, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that the uh, the careers advice service can can be improved in in many respects. Um, I, I I genuinely uh, believe that the investment has to come from industry, um, and that careers advisors will be better supported by an engaged industry, who who are invested in connecting and developing the, the young workforce, um, as opposed to having sector specific careers advisors, um, which is just a personal opinion. Um, I think there's, there's probably scope for both, but ultimately the, the solution will, uh, will come from, uh, from meaningful partnership and collaboration between the education sector and industrial representatives. And I think the question for us is how do we make sure that both of those key partners um, are supported to, to have the conversations and to understand each other's challenges um, and the opportunities that exist for, for connecting with that, that young workforce. How would, you, how would you see that happening? I mean, what improvements would you, well, would you see now? I, I mean, I, again, I think that the, we, we are already starting to see the structure emerging. I think the CITB's um, construction ambassador scheme um, is an excellent example whereby we're no longer just asking industrial representatives to go out and visit a school. Um, they are being trained, they're being supported with uh, with literature, with advice, um, you know, the, uh, the, the risk of um, conflicting information from, uh, from, from different representatives have been reduced. Um, we see Construction Scotland now taking a, a, a leading role uh, in their engagement and outreach activity, which again has become more coordinated, um, it's become more specific and it has been shared throughout the community. Uh, these these are fairly um, or these are programs that are fairly early in the development, um, and rather than than looking for the next solution, I, I do believe that there is value in continuing to invest in these solutions which are emerging, 
and supporting them uh, to, to measure their, their longer-term impact. Uh, SDS skills advisors pr um, providing the advice themselves, they would be facilitating or coordinating access to advice for young people. And uh, absolutely. Uh, again, I think that partnership element is key. One of the pilots we are running with a, a school uh, in Midlothian, Newbell, which is uh, a new school and a product of head teacher there. So we are based in the school. We've got lecturers based in the school two days a week delivering a formal qualification. They've been very flexible with their timetables. They're looking at doing things completely differently. And that model will expand into that programme, which is an entry to construction two days a week, will then move into them progressing into a national progression ward at level five. So at that stage, we'll have a member of staff at that school full-time delivering to those uh, young people. But in addition to that, that member of staff will also be looking at first and second year uh, school pupils to influence them and to provide taster sessions. So it's actually college staff that can really influence and give real uh, high-quality advice on how to progress through the education system for construction. That model, as I say, it was a pilot last year. We've got about our six schools within the region signed up for next year. And we see that model as kind of, for us in this region, because we're dealing with three local authorities, that works for us. Because it's difficult to try and tie up three local authorities with different sort of agendas. This Tuesday, Thursday afternoon school programme where you're shipping young people all over the region isn't an efficient way of doing it. So I see it, certainly for, for us and other parts of the uh, the college sector where I've seen it work very well, that college staff working in schools is probably a very good way to go to bring in the right candidates and provide a really excellent sort of uh, training uh, experience for these students. And then you've got the, the joined up approach where you've got that influencing stage at P7, S1, and then in school from two, three, four, five, tie in that foundation apprenticeship part of it and then into employment, so you've got that seamless uh, progression all the way through the system, is, in my opinion, uh, a model that I think... And that needs work. the schools to be on board on, uh, yes. on that, so but you, you found them to be so... so yeah, far. so most of the schools, we've kind of put this message out, and the schools that have come back to us are the ones that seem to be more proactive and want to do things differently, uh, and we're more, hap more than happy to, to work with these schools and set that model up. Uh, it was very successful in a previous area I used to work. That model was probably set up about four or five years ago in a different region and a different, a slightly different model because they were only dealing with really one local authority, perhaps two, but they worked very closely together. So there was a slightly different model, but along the same lines. Thank you. Dean Locker. Uh, thank you, convener. I want to ask about the apprenticeship levy because it was introduced uh, just over two years ago. We'd like to get the views of the panel of the impact of the apprenticeship levy, positive or negative, and what, what impact it's had on the construction sector. Mr Morrison, you're, you're nodding your head. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, uh, like many, many of our colleges across the sector, um, are actively engaged in administrating the Flexible Workforce Development Fund. Um, and we, uh, we're currently in year two um, of engaging with, uh, with not just construction businesses, but, but businesses more generally. Um, what has surprised us is, the, firstly, the, the volume of interest that, that has come from, uh, from the various industries, which, um, which has been pleasing. Um, but what has, has, what has also surprised us is that the, the focus on requests for training haven't necessarily been uh, aligned to the, the activity in which we'll use construction companies as, as an example. It's not necessarily been aligned to, um, to any specific trade occupation um, or discipline. It has been uh, more targeted towards management, leadership, e-commerce. Um, and really understanding how to improve their business. Now, from a college perspective, that, um, that has enabled us to, to view the way in which we can engage with, uh, with these companies in a slightly different way. Um, and it has facilitated the, the development of conversations around business growth, um, around you know, diversifying their investment in skills beyond the Flexible Workforce uh, Development Fund. 
Um, and also in looking uh, this year with slight change in, uh, in eligibility criteria about how uh, the larger companies within the industry can actually support their supply chain um, through offsetting their, their allocation of flexible workforce development fund. So how they can support their supply chain to become more efficient, to become more productive and ultimately to, to benefit their company. So again, we, we're two years into to the programme. Uh, there, there's lots of learning taking place, um, but the early signs are that we, we are now engaging with, uh, with companies and sectors and organisations that we haven't done in the past, um, and we're having conversations that, that haven't taken place in the past. I, th I think that's that's one of the key points. It, you know, the, the larger contractors uh, have an influence over a, a, a huge supply chain, um, both in the subcontracting and in the supply side. Um, and uh, in my experience, do a, a good amount of support to make sure that the supply chain appreciate where uh, opportunities come from, where funding comes from, where help and assistance can come from, um, and uh, and sort of operate in a, a proactive way to try and get them to upskill um, uh, their own uh, experiences. Uh, my experience is similar to you. A lot of it is about how they upskill their business overall rather than trade specific. Um, it, it's, it's more about the managerial side or the safety side or, uh, or how they make their, their business uh, more attractive one way or another and, and more profitable. Um, so it's maybe taking a slightly different slant than was intended. Um, that's not necessarily a bad thing because that's perhaps what the industry was needing. Mr. Warren, do you have anything on the levy? No, I, I tend to agree with what the panel said. That most of the, the funding that's coming through that hasn't went to upskilling of uh, traditional tradesmen uh, whatsoever. Really. So that's been quite a small part of it. It has been about the management side of it and the CPD for uh, perhaps new processes within businesses, which, as the panel said, it's, uh, that's very good as well. It makes them more efficient. But that's certainly my original thoughts on it would be based around upskilling the workforce within the trades, which hasn't really happened. Just to follow up on that, do you think further clarity is required about what training courses or college places are eligible to qualify for the funding available? Is that part of the um, issue within the sector? There's a bit of uncertainty about what uh, uh, part of the supply chain might qualify for it? I think at the moment, if I, if I remember correctly, the Workforce Development Fund isn't aimed at any formal qualifications, so it's almost bespoke training that, that you're putting it towards. So I think if it, if it did go to part of a formal qualification, it would help. Uh, and those undertaking those qualifications would have that formal qualification on the record, rather than just a bespoke uh, certificate. And all, all I'd like to add is that um, we, we do work to very strict criteria. Um, that's set by the by the Scottish Funding Council, um, and feedback from from the companies that we are working with has been very positive. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. I come finally to questions from Angela Constance. Much, uh, Kevina. I've got two two questions. Uh, the first question is, is picking up on some of the um, earlier themes, in particular mentioned by uh, Scott uh, Warden, and therefore I wonder what more could government and local authorities do to ensure that we have a seamless uh, school and college education system? I think it's at the moment. So if we're looking at kind of Edinburgh. College model dealing with three local authorities is can be problematic because there's different agendas there, uh, and although they do try and work together and have, as I said, for construction, we look at this uh, kind of the school college partnership within that region a Tuesday and Thursday afternoon, uh, which isn't a great system for, as I said, you're trying to ship. We have something like 120 uh, uh, school kids coming to the college at this moment in time. That will change but they're being shipped all around the, the region. So it's based at the moment. What I've found easiest when trying to set up these sort of programmes is you find a proactive school, you go into the school, and they're flexible with how they want to deliver their curriculum and their timetable. So it gets almost a stage where it is uh, a bespoke programme for that school. But leaning on from that, I think, at this moment in time, we have about six or seven schools tied into this programme for next year. If they can't fill the places that 
we're hoping then it becomes a kind of that hub and spoke system where other schools will transfer students into that school. I understand the, the issues and difficulties mm -hmm. that you've described just now and, and earlier. I suppose what I'm keen to pinpoint yeah. is what more could local government at a national level and the Scottish Government do at a national level to ensure that the system across the country is more flexible and that addresses the issues such as, you know, the, the promotion and the expansion of foundation apprenticeships? I suppose that there it's like having a consistent approach. So the model I, I discussed earlier on, that influencing stage in the second, third, fourth, uh, in work, in school delivery from college staff, or in some cases coming to the college, and then that foundation apart, it's a consistency, knowing that schools do want to do it and they're they're engaged in it, but it's that flexibility around what happens with schools. It's, it doesn't seem to be, I know we're wanting consistency, but it doesn't seem to be the, the one size fits all. Some schools would be more proactive and happier to have a foundation apprenticeship within that school, or they're looking for a university route, uh, whereas a number of other schools that we're dealing with at the moment want that construction route at the lower because they have a very low percentage of uh, learners going to university. So there needs to be almost a consistent route through the education system nationally, uh, but a bit of flexibility within there and the funding attached to that to support it. Because even though we're looking at that model of in-house delivery, it's a costly model to the college sector and we're almost subsidising that with other parts because these pilots are, are probably not sustainable going forward. That we need to mainstream it. Okay, and continuing on the theme of having our education system properly blended and dovetailed, bearing in mind that universities and colleges are autonomous bodies, what then could government uh, and other bodies do to ensure that provision is dovetailed and, as you said earlier, uh, not uh, duplicated? Because, you know, I, do, I certainly wouldn't want to see for example, uh, the higher education that's available within the college sector, I would not want to see that shrink because the universities are doing it all themselves. Um, so, no, I think it's trying, the college sector, and certainly what we're doing at the moment, I think we deal very well with uh, the programmes that are in place to take us up to that fourth year sort of education level. Where the, the waters get muddy a little bit is when we start to input uh, the foundation apprenticeship and associate degrees and the university almost competing with us. So the ideal situation, I suppose, for a college sector would be that these students that would go to, typically go to university would come to the college sector and do their HNC or their HND and then go into third or fourth year in university. So there is no duplication. It is just that seamless process, uh, progression throughout. Even if, there was, even if it was just the HNC part of it, but the college sector knew that we would be delivering all of the HNC and they went to university for uh, second, third, fourth. But we don't really seem to have much control over that. And the dropout of students on the HND programme, certainly for the college sector, and leaving to go back into the first year of a university programme just seems very difficult. And it's how... If, if there's any help that we need, I suppose it's from government to tidy up these number of different routes and almost going backwards at times uh, just to go into a university programme. But before I change subject completely, I just wondered if Douglas Morrison wanted to add anything to what Scott has said. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's a complex landscape. Um, and if we as the education sector can do anything um, to, to support... Uh, more young people coming into the industry, it would be to, to simplify that landscape. Um, for me, there there are um, there are some structural barriers that are in place. Uh, again, Scott's spoken today about the, the foundation apprenticeship. One of the key challenges around um, introducing a foundation apprenticeship in in construction uh, is is the need to have workplace experience. Um, and construction sites are inherently dangerous places. 
Um, there is an expectation that um, competence uh, around health and safety practices is demonstrated before going into the workplace. And so we, we do need to ask questions about how we, uh, how we can support young people to demonstrate that competence and get them, get them out into the workplace uh, at an earlier stage. Uh, because again, our, our current system is very much predicated on a linear progression through an academic pathway. Um, and what I would like to see is a, a more flexible progression through vocational work-based learning pathways. Uh, and the work that um, Centre for Work-Based Learning in particular uh, is of real interest in that regard uh, as they um, assess and critique different models which may deliver um, such, such a, a status. Okay, and my final question, convener, because your we, time is short. Uh, Ms Hamilton, you mentioned earlier um, that throughout the course of the recession that it was you know, much harder to attract women to uh, construction and that women were more likely to uh, drop out of, of, of the sector. Um, what now would be useful to encourage older learners, particularly women, uh, either to return to the sector or to embark upon uh, career changes? couple aspects on that. Um, uh, the larger organisations generally have a returners programme, probably created for, for getting women back into the workplace, but actually anyone that's taken a career break um, uh, or a career break away from construction. Um, and I think these programmes are really good, but they're not joined up at all. Um, uh, and I think even within the contracting side of, of the business, there could be a coherent approach. But if you take the whole of construction, I think there could be a much more uh, coherent approach. Whether that's led by local authorities or, or government, um, I'm not sure where the best, best source it is, but if you look at the 5% the, um, the club, started off with one or two contractors and is now slowly but surely uh, crossing over uh, different spheres. And I think that kind of thing could work quite well. So I, th I think to get returners to work is, is a, a big thing to help um, with, uh, with the, the diversity, without a doubt. But getting probably at the school level that, that you're really talking about, Scott, when, you, when you're in at the schools trying to get that message across that uh, it's open doors for, for women coming into this industry. What, in Scotland, we've got less than 1% women in the trades. I find that quite frightening. I've been in this industry for 40 years. I would have hoped it would have changed by now. So I think it's really important that we push that very, very hard. Good. OK, thanks, convener. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much to the panel for uh, coming in today. And um, I'll now suspend the meeting to allow a few minutes for witnesses to change over. Thank you.
We'll now move to item three on the agenda, which relates to subordinate legislation. Um, two items. Uh, first of all, Public Procurement etc. Scotland Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019. And secondly, the Public Procurement etc. Scotland Amendment EU Exit Amendment Regulations 2019. As these are both inextricably linked, we intend to consider them together. And uh, after that, we will make formal decisions about each of them separately. So, first of all, I welcome Derek Mackay and the officials with him, Alistair Hamilton and Mark Richards. I'll invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a, a brief opening statement, and then I'll come to committee members for any questions that they may have on either instrument. Um, Cabinet Secretary. Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, as you say, we currently have three SSIs in Scotland that transpose the three EU procurement directives as well as a Scottish Act and regulations made under that. Now, today the committee is considering two of the draft SSIs which amend these pieces of legislation. The first draft SSI, it was withdrawn and relayed to address some minor drafting issues identified by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. And it became necessary to lay a further SSI when the UK government changed its approach to how to deal with international agreements. So the regulations we're discussing today are designed to make sure that the legislation governing public procurement still functions in the event of a no-deal Brexit. So the objective is to retain as far as possible the status quo on day one. Firstly, because the EU Withdrawal Act allows for the correction of deficiencies arising from exit, not wholesale changes of policy, and that's a really important point to understand what we're being asked to approve uh, today. Secondly, to give as much certainty to buyers and businesses as possible in otherwise chaotic times. Thirdly, because we anticipate the UK will be party to the WTO Government Procurement Agreement, GPA, from which the many requirements of the EU directives arise. So the basics of procurement will therefore be the same as today. Uh, through uh, although public bodies will advertise contracts on a new UK e-notification system instead of the official journal of the EU, of course, always known as uh, OJU, having one site per signatory is a requirement uh, of the WTO GPA. In practice, however, Scottish public bodies will continue to use Public Contracts Scotland as required by the Procurement Reform Scotland Act 2014 which will forward ad adverts in the same way as it currently forwards to the European uh, Official Journal. So some powers to legislate are transferred from the European Commission to Scottish ministers, uh, but these would all be subject to negative procedure, as they're either simple updating powers or powers which set out the pre precise conditions under which they can, indeed must, uh, be used and offer no scope for discretion, no policy change, so to speak. So in relation to the rights of bidders from other countries, we followed the UK government's requested approach in the first SSI. The UK then changed its ask of us and indeed its own approach, leading to the second SSI. And the delays to the trade bill mean it's not safe to assume that the powers in it can be relied upon to implement the UK's accession to the GPA or to the rollover of the EU's other agreements in time for exit. The effect of the two SSIs, therefore, is to extend the EU's obligations in this field for 18 months after exit, by which time it's assumed that the Trade Bill will be law or another piece of primary legislation dealing with it will be. So uh, we'll have to do this um, to make sure that our laws are compatible, um, sticking and you know, staying with the UK's international obligation. It is, I think you'll agree, a rather unsatisfactory sticking plaster approach but it is born from the current position in terms of the negotiations with the UK government and the EU, and we're trying to provide as much stability as possible. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I'll turn first of all to John Mason. Uh, thanks, Convener, and thanks for the opening statement. I just wonder if I can ask a, a few things for clarification. There's this suggestion that if, if there is a no-deal exit from the EU, then accession to the WTO GPA would be, and the phrase I've seen is, shortly after exit day. Yeah. I mean, can you expand on what that means? And I mean, how late could it be? How soon could it be? Just anything around that? Best case 
them, it's a month, about 30 days. And the reason for that is the, uh, the point of departure, the point of accession is about a month. So that's, that's the time frame we're looking at. Wider time frames, if, the, if there is a deal, then there'll be the transition period. So you've got the two years, well, you've got that period to plan through, of course. If there's no deal, uh, then the, essentially the new arrangements apply the day after, but the period of um, WTO GPA rules is about a month. That's, again, not ideal, but that is what we're living within. That's okay. understanding. Right, that's helpful to start with. So some of the uh, evidence we've had from different authorities, for example, health boards, um, have raised the concern that they will then be dealing with two systems. Uh, okay, <laughs> well, maybe that's, that, that's answered my question. I mean, if I could... Uh, I'll go into um, detail. I right, that's fine. If you get to the case. Maybe a more detail, because they seem to think that, you know, if they entered uh, uh, under the old system uh, a kind of lengthy, a three-year contract, they would still have to be operating under the previous system, but then within 30 days, they could be also be operating a new system. So could you maybe respond to that? No, uh, there's a switch over, if you like, and there is some detail. And I think that's why this committee session is quite useful for... Um, people may be raising their concerns and we can correct any misunderstandings as we understand it as well. It, so the issue is at the point of transfer, when there are the new arrangements, it's those procurement rules that apply. So there won't be two systems. But if a, there is one that has already begun, actually, as we switch over to the new system, it's that that complies. There might be some exceptional circumstances, and that would be set out in detail. Uh, where there is an understanding at, at which point there's a crossover, but at no point we'll be operating two regimes. It will go from the existing regime to the replacement regime, a switch over, if you like, so there will not be a requirement to have the two. It will switch in terms of moving from the current EU position uh, to the uh, World Trade Organization GPA. Be a clear-cut switch yeah. as far as the tendering and the award of the contract was concerned, even though a contract then ran for some time, but that would be that would be less important, presumably. Well, well they're both important. Uh, procurement rules are procurement rules at the point of how you advertise and set about procurement, but a contract that's signed, I am, surround, I am advised at least by one lawyer and one policy official, but whatever you've signed up to in the contract is what you'll be obliged to, to stay within. However, the rules for how you go about procurement are the rules at that point in time. Yes, the, the... Yes, I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> Feel free. Right, I, th I think I'll leave it at that. That's fine, thanks. Um, Andy Whiteman. Yes, perhaps Cabinet Secretary you can clear up a confusion here. You, you said that accession should take a maximum of a month. That's the time scale that we've been advised, yes. Yes, OK. So maybe I'm confusing two things, but the, the draft instrument sets the period of time at eight months, um, assuming that powers in the Trade Bill would be available. Um, once the powers under the Trade Bill are available, it'll take one month. We're talking about uh, essentially accession from um, uh, lodging the, the, the terminology of, of lodging it. So this is where the lawyers and the policy officials will be helpful. You are now asking two separate questions. Um, so in terms of what the Trade Bill does, but, but what we're trying to do in terms of the UK leaving the European Union, of course. So that's the point at which it's important. Uh, and then is complying with what's necessary in terms of the WTO GPA, the, the, the Governmental Procurement Agreement. So there is that gap between the, what we're leaving and what we're trying to join in terms of the WTO. That's the estimate of the period of a month. It, so just to be clear, you've asked a slightly different question. Yeah, what, just, what? Uh, just to add, that, add to that, last week the WTO Government Procurement Agreement Committee formally invited the UK to accede. So the UK will now be going through its domestic ratification procedures. After that, it has to lodge its um, instrument of accession with the WTO Secretariat. And 30 days after that, the UK will accede to the GPA, assuming there's no deal. Separately, um, we need to implement the, the requirements of that in domestic law. So because we don't have the powers in the trade bill just now, we can't do that um, in our own right. So the effect of what we're doing now is to continue the obligations on the EU in domestic law. The obligations on the EU will be the same as the obligations on the UK because we'll be exceeding on the same basis. And this is far from ideal and has only come about the UK government hasn't got the trade bill through in the fashion that they wanted at the time at which they've wanted. The negotiations haven't provided the necessarily uh, 
clarity as well, and that's why there's an unfortunate gap. But obviously, we are trying to make sure that we are uh, competent uh, within an unsatisfactory um, set of circumstances. So um, and I think the UK government might still be suffering from something of an optimism bias to get everything in place in time. Uh, but I'm sure that's something we'll debate elsewhere. So the amendment amendment regulations extending the period to 18 months is, is purely to give greater flexibility and ensure that the powers are going to be available under so the Trade Bill. It's not even as exciting as that, Mr Whiteman. What it is what these regulations are trying to do, and I was quite worried that I would have raised your expectations about what we could do around policy. These are statutory instruments that only allow us to address the deficiencies that come about from the bill itself. Uh, it won't give us much power in terms of policy, but it allows us to address the deficiencies. For example, fix um, administrative lists of things or to address any loopholes or deficiencies that there may be in the regulations. And we're trying to do that from day one of enactment, essentially. OK, thank you. Any further questions from members? If not, we'll move from the more exciting part of these proceedings to the formal part of matters. Um, so we'll turn, first of all, to the Public Procurement Etc. Scotland Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019. And, um, so that one will be moved first, and I'll move to the formal debate on the motion to approve, and I'll invite the Cabinet Secretary to formally move the motion. Moved. Thank you. Does any member wish to speak in the debate on the motion? If not, um, I'll put the question. The question is that motion S5M15751 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Um, in that event, that is agreed, and I now move on. <coughs> to the second <coughs> instrument, and that is the Public Procurement Etc. Scotland Amendment EU Exit Amendment Regulations 2019, and move to immediately to the formal debate on the motion to approve and invite the Cabinet Secretary again to move the motion. Moved. Uh, does any member wish to speak in the debate on this motion? If not, in that event, I will simply put the question, which is that motion S5M15921 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. That is agreed. And in light of the timing, I'll invite the committee to agree that uh, I, as convener and the clerk, should produce a short factual report simply setting out the committee's decisions on both instruments and arrange to have that published. Are we agreed on that? Yes. Thank you, and in that event, I'll thank the Cabinet Secretary and the two officials for coming in and suspend the meeting. Thank you. The committee will now move to item five on the agenda, which is consideration of a proposal by the Scottish Government to consent to the UK Government legislating using the powers under the European Union Withdrawal Act 2018 in relation to a proposed UK statutory instrument, being the UK Statistics Amendment Etc. EU Exit Regulations 2019. The notification relates to amendments that would repeal retained EU laws arise and related to EU statistics and correct deficiencies arising from EU exit to ensure the continued functioning of the UK legal framework. This would enable the UK statistical system to produce official statistics in the event that the UK leaves the EU without an agreement to include the UK in the European statistical system. The notification suggests that this is a category A proposal, that is to say one that is technical with minimum policy choice or only one obvious policy solution. Is the committee content for these matters to be dealt with by a statutory instrument laid at Westminster? Yes. Yes. Uh, the committee being content, I will write to the Cabinet Secretary to notify him of the committee's decision. And at this point, we'll move into private session.